Brooklyn. Well, good afternoon and um, welcome everyone back and thanks for our guests coming. As I mentioned a moment ago, we'll, we'll change our agenda a bit to accommodate our guests so that we would hear from them who are visiting to make public comment right away. And then we'll go back to kind of our regular agenda, which you're all welcome to stay for also. So with that in mind, I'm going to ask Mertz to, um, to uh, start that process. Okay, I've got several public participation forms. You will all have three minutes to address the board. When I call your name, you can um, proceed to the end of the table. And if you have handouts, um, you if you'd give them to, I think, the Michigan Teacher of the Year, Gary Abood would be happy to just take them and distribute them around the table. And I just want to remind you that the board does not engage in a conversation at the table, but are happy to hear what you've come to say. Thank you. Okay, the first speaker is Tracy Peters, and next up will be Karen Harper Royal. Tracy, if you'd come to the table. This is correct. Yes. Three minutes. Yes. Correct? Yes. Thank you. My name is Tracy Peters. I'm a Detroit resident, a practicing attorney, and still hold my professional teaching license from the state of Michigan. I'm not here to comment on the law. But I like to say that I'm an attorney for disclosure purposes. Um, in fact, my comments probably speak more to my tenure working in Michigan for 16 years, um, and my comments on the EAA versus what I'm what I'm kind of used to as a teacher. Um, Superintendent Flanagan, I'm here to ask for your support and your efforts to withdraw and stop the expansion of the EAA. Um, that's my wish and to do what you can to restore the 15 schools to the Detroit Public Schools. State Board of Ed members, I'm here to ask for your support in supporting the superintendent to take this action for the following three reasons. Um, your endorsement seems to ignore the data that's been presented, I would say since about June of 2012, just on, for me as a teacher, what's most troubling is, is the baseline conditions that were presented um, by Dr. Tom Perdroni of, of Wayne State. Just from my perspective as giving assessments, um, a marked increase that originally was given under baseline conditions where there was a lot of equipment not working and chaotic. It seems, it seems difficult to measure that. Um, number two, the EAA is a statewide, state of Michigan district. Um, it's not founded on a lack of transparency, but that's a huge component. I'm not here to argue PA 436. But I feel that when we in Detroit, um, and when I say we, I say we and some of my, my parent neighbors, very confused about looking at the top to bottom list and the eventual schools that went in. Um, I know that Roy Roberts had discretion to make that decision. I, I absolutely know that. I would just hope that as a public body, this board could do, I don't know, somehow entertain a conversation with the governor. Can we revisit that? Can we have more transparency if you decide to expand? and enter more schools. Um, my last point speaks to the materials used. Um, I have been in three of the high schools and done, for lack of a better operative verb, uh, buzz. And I, you know, I was a fourth grade teacher here, and I watched the successive finesse by the MDA, or MDE with the ELA grade four prep materials. They're awesome. You know, MEEP test is, is high stakes stuff. Your name is on that. Your name is also on what we're putting through in the EAA in it, and it stands for our whole state. And I'm very concerned that the educational materials they're delivering, apart from state curriculum, it's it's just not it's not up to par what I'm what I'm used to seeing as the as the state of Michigan's educational materials. Um, for these reasons, I'm respectfully requesting that you reconsider expansion and restore the 15 schools to the Detroit Public Schools. Thank you. Our next speaker is Karen Harper Royal, and following her will be Mayu Vang. Is it possible for Majua to go before me? Yeah, I, I can just go before her. Yes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Majua Vang, and I speak as a citizen resident of Dearborn, Michigan. I actually am here today because I am submitting three-minute testimony from someone, uh, Dr. Mercedes Snyder of New Orleans, uh, and she's a quant methods professor, psychometrician, and she can't make it today, so here's her video testimony. My name is Karen Harper Royal, and I'm a 
is Mercedes Schneider. I am a Louisiana public school teacher, and I have been asked to give testimony at this December 17, 2013, Michigan State Board of Education meeting. Superintendent Flanagan and members of the board, thank you for hearing my testimony. I'd like to talk to you in these five minutes uh, about RSD, the Recovery School District in Louisiana. It has been promoted as a national miracle. It is not a national miracle. Uh, like most models, this model has been airbrushed, and I'd like to let you know a little bit about how that works. First off, RSD was started before Katrina in 2003. The score for schools to be put in RSD was set at 60, and at that level, I know you don't know the meaning of that score, but it didn't yield as many schools in the state of the recovery school district as those who wanted to start uh, a charter district desired. After Hurricane Katrina, the legislature passed a bill that should, that raised that score. So any school below average uh, could be put in that district, and that put uh, upwards of 100 schools in the district. It did not put all of the Orleans Parish schools. The Louisiana Constitution would not allow for the dissolving of the district, even though that's what was desired. So in Orleans Parish, there are actually two districts. There's the Orleans Parish School District, which is about, consists of about 17 schools. And then there is the state-run recovery school district, RSD, which is similar to what I think you guys call an achievement district. And that's uh, around 100 schools, roughly. Uh, not all of them are receiving scores right now, which is another trend, so it's hard for me to say exactly how many schools. Uh, it's a lot of schools. The district itself is above an 83% charter. Uh, this, the state decided a few years ago to give letter grades to schools. We had had student, uh, school performance scores for years before then. Of course, they did not get the public attention that letter grades get, and the letter grades are a game. I need to tell you that uh, here's how the game works. The letter grades always stay the same, A, B, C, D, F. But what changes behind the letter grades, there's three things that can be manipulated. One. The tests used to yield the letter grades, the tests and measures. Two, the formula for calculating the letter grades. And three, the grading scale. In this last year, this last set of school performance scores, the way that that has been manipulated to make RSD look like it's moving forward is that schools that were not achieving, their students could earn bonus points but only if they, if they underachieved, if once, they, once the student received a basic on the state exam, the bonus points disappeared. Now the beauty here is that RSD has never done that well with letter grades. It's been predominantly a D and F district by the state's own letter grade formula. And so that's a really hard sell to say that the eight-year-old, it's been eight years since Hurricane Katrina, the eight-year-old recovery school district is a miracle because it's mostly D's and F's. Uh, and so the, the bonus points has bumped up the, the grade sum, some D's to C's, so now schools are saying, oh, we're C schools, isn't that great? It's not so great, because when RSD was created, the big call was for uh, improvement, a, a great improvement, the state will take over and greatly improve, which they have never done. But the rules have changed. One thing that is true of the charters in New Orleans is that some of them are selective admissions charters. Uh, those get mixed in with the others. Uh, we also have a call for open enrollment now, and Orleans Parish School is a handful of... She's finishing up. 30 more seconds. ...have chosen to participate in open enrollment, but uh, those schools still are fast. Now, I have on the board behind me my blog. You should go to my blog and read about it. The articles under RSD is really too much for me to talk about here. One of the chaotic pieces is something called the One App, the parental application uh, for applying for RSD schools. Uh, I walk people through that One App. It's a chaotic process. You will notice if you look at the One App that many of the schools are still rated D and F, so parents are given the choice to move their kids mostly to D and F schools. Uh, you will notice how complicated the One App is, uh, and there are errors on the application, so there is, that is no solution. Um, RSD was designed to be uh, really under-regulated. The Charter Audit 2012 shows that John White either refuses to give site visits. I know I'm out of time. Thank you for your
time. John White is the superintendent of, uh, of public instruction in Louisiana, and he will not visit the charter schools because of budget cuts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And our seated at the table is Karen Harper Royal. She will be followed by Victor Gibson. Good afternoon. Thank you for allowing me to speak before you today. Uh, I am a public school parent in New Orleans. I also work with public school parents in New Orleans. Most of the parents I work with, their children have disabilities that I help them navigate through the public school system. Uh, I have uh, two sons who have gone through the public school system. My second son is now a senior at a charter school in New Orleans, and he's been at the same school since before it was a charter. So over the last 21 years, I've had a chance to see our school system change drastically as a, as a student <coughs> myself. Um, I and my siblings went through the school system. It worked well for me and my sister, not so much for our brothers. And our brothers continue to struggle. So when my first son attended school in New Orleans 21 years ago, I ended up quitting my job when he was in kindergarten because school wasn't working for him and I did not want to see a pattern repeat in our family. Um, over these years, uh, I have seen so many changes that were designed to help children just like my brothers, but in the last eight years since Hurricane Katrina, the recovery school district, which was similar to your EAA, really has trapped children in a failing school system. I see this with the parents that I work with who are desperately trying to get their children out of the recovery school district. Some of the problems, especially those children with disabilities are facing, is that they have become a liability to a school district that where competition for students is so important. And I'm going to leave with you this Access Denied booklet, which uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center presented a report on how some of the children in our city are being shuffled around and not really served with little state oversight. If you're going to have an EAA, oversight is paramount. But what we see is that because there is a state interest in perpetuating chartering of schools, there's really no incentive to make the schools in the recovery school district successful because an unsuccessful school becomes justification for handing it over to a charter operator. There are some charters that seem to operate fine, some that don't. But many of them depend on certain types of students. So you, and, and as Dr. Schneider said, you can't really trust the data coming out of Louisiana because it's been manipulated in so many ways. Parents are facing schools that are closing and their kids are moved to other schools in the recovery school district only to find that that school is going to be closed a year or two later. If you're in to creating an EAA so that you can help the most challenged children understand following the New Orleans model will not get you there. Don't let it take eight years like we are seeing in New Orleans to see that you followed a failed model. The very first school that was placed into the recovery school district in 2003 was Capto Charter School. Today, Capto Charter School, 10 years later, is an F-rated school. Uh, sorry, my time's up. I could tell you so much more, but I will leave this document with you. Uh, and, and, and if anybody, will, I left my contact information on the card. I would be happy to share more information with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for being here. Yeah. Our next speaker is Victor Gibson, followed by Helen Moore. Good morning to everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Real briefly, my name is Victor Gibson. I'm being affectionately called Baba Gibson at my school, Malcolm X Academy, which I just recently retired. I am 23 years in the system of teaching African-centered culture to our children, and that's what I wish to come and address to you today. We know that in 99, what happened to Detroit schools was something like a deliberate takeover and setback for African-Americans, and in the spirit of Nelson Mandela, and we will call it apartheid in Detroit, what we'll call it, you have basically created a system whereby we cannot finish the job that we were started in 1990. Now, historically, I am the teacher of the year for Michigan in the Detroit public schools. I was given that honor in 2011 and 2012. And the reason I kind of left the school system is, is because of what you all have, have, what has happened to Detroit public schools, in that we had a solution for the School to, pipe, school to jail pipeline, as we call it now. And we had a solution for it, and the solution was very effective. We were on our way to correcting 
half the cultural problems that are facing African Americans in this country, not just in Detroit, because we were a model for school districts all over America. And since that time, we've come back and we've set African American achievement culturally wise, not just academically, but culturally wise, back, as Governor Inglis said back when he took over the schools, 50 years he was going to take Detroit's choice of public schools back. And in 50 years from 1999, that will leave you about 1950s. And in those 1950s, we've seen what has happened to a people who have been decidedly cut out of the curriculum. We're not talking about the schools, the EAA schools in which you all set up. We're talking about the curriculum that goes into that teaching. If you're not going to educate a people back to their right minds, then what are you going to end up having is a group of people that's going to be permanently subculture or sub-citizens of the overall mainstream. And these are things we need to kind of look at. When Martin Luther King said it best. When you place people in darkness, you will get the darkness. And those of you who are able to remember the 1960s and the riots and the foolishness and the anger that our people portrayed because they thought they were not being heard, that they were not being given a fair chance, you are subject to see that again. I don't want to be a messiah. That is not my purpose. But I'm here to warn each and every one of you. If America is going to be great, truly great, then all its citizens must have their right minds. Not just the Asians, not just the Hispanics, not just the Euros, not just the Italians, but especially the African Americans, based on the fact that we were the ones who, were, who much, much was taken from and very little has been allowed to get back. So I ask you to reconsider not just the curriculum, not just the schools, but the curriculum in which we are educating a particular race of people. And thank you. That will be my last two minutes. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Helen Moore, please, followed by Tony Baker. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. The last time I was here was the Oakland Orthopedic School. I think you all will remember. I represent a coalition, Keep the Vote, No Takeover Coalition, 24 different groups, including the Black Parents for Quality Education and the Detroit Public School Education Task Force. So I'm here today not just to talk about our children and what's happened to them, but I want to talk about injustice. We are talking much of the time about the EAA. And many times, good people who really want the best for children are sometimes either afraid to do the right thing or just don't have it in them to do the right thing. The right thing for us in the city of Detroit, since we're the only ones that are affected by this EAA that is failing and we have the documentation, we're saying to you, don't continue this experiment. It is killing our children. They are unhappy, and some of the parents were told that they must go to these schools. And once we found that out and met with parents in the churches, in the schools, we found out that they received a letter that said, you got to go to this school we've assigned. This is not slavery. Our children are not slaves. We know that we have choices, and I hear a lot of you talking about choices. When we found that out and when we addressed the parents, they say, we didn't know we, were, we couldn't go to those schools. And so they begin to leave. And they're leaving in groves, and they're going to leave even more. Now, I came here to save you all. I'm not Jesus Christ. But you all have children in school systems that are not in Detroit public schools. And Mr. Flanagan, you're talking about extending this experiment. I want to tell you, don't do it. All you Republicans and people, I hope you're listening. You do not want to do to your children exactly what happened to Detroit Public Schools. When the shoe gets on the other foot and it happens to you, then all of a sudden you're going to be later on down the way when children find out that they've been put into a failing school system. It will ruin them for the rest of their life. It is a label. Our children have been labeled enough being black. We're saying to you, don't allow this to happen to your children. Don't extend this program. In fact, uh, Mr. Flanagan, write a letter to the children and the parents in Detroit Public Schools and tell them they are not slaves, that they do not have to go to the EAA schools. Give them a choice and tell the other people that are affected by this inhumane act 
tell them don't send your children because the same thing that's happened to our children will happen to them. Case in point, children sitting in classrooms with these computers, looking at porno. How do I know? I was at the teaching from some of these children, from some of these teachers. Looking at porno, there is no safe gap with teachers that are facilitators and are not teaching. Our children deserve more than that. And I know my time is up and I'm just gonna say to all of you, be brave. Mr. Flanagan, if you're not gonna do for the children of Detroit, then you need to be fired. And these people around the table can fire. As far as I'm concerned, you have not done justice to our children. And I hope all of you think about it. Think about Nelson Mandela and all the good whites that sat back and allowed that to happen to the blacks. This is what you're doing to our children in Detroit. Start thinking about it and do no harm. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tony Baker, followed by Elizabeth Larwa. Hello, my name is Tony Baker. I'm the director of the Center for Latino Studies at Ferris State University. I'm also a, a Grand Rapids Public School Board member, so I really appreciate the deliberation and thoughtfulness you have in discussing the issues here today. Um, I'm here to discuss an issue um, concern related to the recent uh, changes in the professional readiness test um, and, and inform the board and department of this concern. First of all, I'd like to thank you for um, the department's support in raising the bar for teacher preparation. Um, at Ferris, in an effort to create a broader classroom teacher pool, we have created a new partnership with Grand Rapids Public Schools to alleviate the cultural disparities between GRPS students and its teaching staff by creating a distinct teacher certification path for adult professionals such as pair of pros, child care workers, and teacher's aides. We currently are creating a cohort of approximately 20 seasoned professionals who have many dedicated years of, of teaching experience um, in, in, in supportive roles. Um, most persons in this cohort are African American or Latino and bilingual adults. Um, we believe that in order to meet the growing demand for bilingual teachers, that tapping into the current pool of dedicated school personnel will benefit children more quickly. These working professionals, mostly in elementary or special education, however, are often more distant from formal academic training in math and writing. Um, yet they are very skilled at many of the more difficult aspects of classroom teaching, such as classroom management or understanding the cultural backgrounds of the students. Um, the new uh, MTTC test requirements are creating a significantly increased barrier to the teaching profession for these adult recruits. Ferris did anticipate this need to prepare students to take the test. We created a 10-week workshop uh, in the subjects of the tests um, uh, to begin this preparation. We began this last October. We're offering this free of charge to the students in order to get them past the significant hurdle towards acceptance <laughs> into the School of Education. <laughs> the results of the October test, though, have us leery about the ability to prepare this cohort for the level academic rigor required for the test. The reports of current college students with above average ACT scores who are flunking the test has created a level of concern for the students. We would summarize our concerns below. Um, the overall rigor of the test has perhaps raised the bar too high in general, especially in relationship to the type of testing involved and the actual career interests of our students. Um, it may have an unintended consequence of limiting adult or returning students. It may also uh, limit efforts to increase teaching force diversity, especially for potential non-native English um, pers speaking personnel, which will be necessary for the growing number of ELL students in the state. Um, if there are no changes to the test, and really this is just a request because I'm not expecting a change, I think that a lot of the work has gone into it, but we would encourage you to monitor the impact uh, of this test on diverse populations, especially for returning adult students as they enter into alternative certification programs such as this new initiative at Ferris. We would not want to limit the contributions of these well-prepared prospective students. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Elizabeth Larwa is next, followed by Al Chapel. Good afternoon. My name is Elizabeth Larva. I have been a fourth grade teacher for 39 years. I have a master's degree in elementary science curriculum from the University of Michigan. And in 2007, I was the recipient of the Presidential Award for Excellence in Science Teaching for the State of Michigan. I'm here to share about the next generation science standards. And by trying to give you a brief snap snapshot of how NGSS might look different in a classroom, 
from the current grade level grade level content expectations, or GLICs as we commonly call them. A current core idea in the GLICs for fourth graders is to learn about the Earth, Sun, and Moon. In my classroom, students would read, have hands-on experiences, watch videos, research, and write about the topic. The culminating activity would be for students to make a model showing the relationship of the Earth, Sun, Moon by, and trying to demonstrate to me what they learned about revolution, orbit, day and night, etc. This is considered a science practice, communicating information and ideas. Now let's look at the same core idea about Earth, Sun, Moon in NGSS. The difference is the students are also asked to, quote, engage in argument from evidence, unquote, which is one of the eight science and engineering practices. It's also one of the practices from the Common Core for Mathematics and ELA, too. This means that after the students learn about the information and create their model, they would go a step further. They would sit down together, look closely at their models, and have a conversation. The, NGS, the NGSS document states that students should, quote, respectfully provide and receive critiques from peers about a proposed model by citing relevant evidence and posing specific questions, unquote. Does the model communicate the intended information and ideas? Is the creator of the model able to cite evidence to support his or her ideas? Do parts of the model need to be changed or reworked? Then the model should be revisited, by this, revisited because scientists and engineers want to, quote, identify the best explanation for a natural phenomenon. Unquote. By going through this process, students will have dealt with the information in a much deeper and more sophisticated manner. Changing the current standards will take a lot of time and effort. So I hope you will consider having a discussion about the next generation science standards. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your work. I'm going to take privilege for a second because I know EAA folks are leaving, some who are interested in the topic, and I want to at least restate something I said this morning, which is that what we announced last week was that schools that were going to be named in our original plan in 2013 will not be. And that our concern was that we needed options beyond the EAA and hope those options will be in place in 2014. So what this was saying is, in spite of our previous announcement that we would put schools in by the end of this year, meaning this December, we postponed that and said we're not doing it until 14, and that's with the hope that the legislature will create other options beyond the EAA for us to make those assignments. Because what the, what the department does is you put it in the state reform district, and right now, we're not content with the only option being that when they're there, their only option is to go to the EAA. We believe there needs to be other options, and we're working towards that end. But in essence, what happened was we postponed doing that this month until next year in order to be able to hopefully get other options for that. And not only because I saw a few having to leave, I think the, uh, I appreciate the person who took the trip all the way from New Orleans to come here and wanted her to hear that because she very much appreciated to hear that voice. And, uh, and I know, I'm, uh, well, I think you've made some excellent points with our own understanding of the reform district there. So um, thank you for bringing that back up. Our next speaker is Al Chapel, followed by Hannah Miller. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Alan Chapel, and I've been fortunate enough to have taught in the Midland Public Schools for the past 23 years. As a high school biology teacher, I'm highly supportive of the board adopting these world-class uh, science standards known as the Next Generation Science Standards that include climate science, and please do it right away. The uh, NGSS, <coughs> these are big improvements over the current standards. I actually spoke with my team leader at uh, Midland High School, and we couldn't really put a finger on when we had changed over to the current standards. We thought it was eight to 10 years. So 
right now those current standards are, are outdated. The example that I'm going to use is climate science. The evidence is what I teach my kids in school, to follow the evidence. If you follow the evidence, you can find support or refusal for your concepts or ideas. Michigan, and I'm, I was a K-12 um, science teacher in Michigan for a few years, and now I'm studying science education and educational psychology at Michigan State University. And I am encouraging the board to adopt the next generation science standards because of the interdisciplinary nature of the, of the standards. Um, they connect all scientific subjects together, so science departments, the teachers that are teaching science can come together and create a curriculum that's very connected and the knowledge will be very connected for, for the students. And so this connected knowledge would allow students to make informed um, scientific decisions, um, for instance, to mitigate climate change or for many other um, important social implications of science. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Tim Fisher, please, followed by Paul Drummond. <coughs> Hello, Mr. Superintendent and the board. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, address you this afternoon. My name is Tim Fisher, and I'm the Deputy Policy Director at the Michigan Environmental Council. And I'm also the, the father of four children, which is why I look so tired all the time. <laughs> and I, I just wanted to, to speak with you a little bit about the next generation science standards. We strongly support them and want my children and, and other children in Michigan uh, to benefit from this uh, from these standards as as soon as possible what I have here is over um, uh, signatures of over 6,000 uh, parents grandparents aunts uncles um, and science supporters uh, they've signed this petition uh, calling on you to adopt these standards and I'll start passing these right here there are names and then uh, comments uh, and on some of those, and I think the comments are, are summarized in the back if you are interested. Uh, I understand that you also received a, an electronic copy of, of these by email on December 3. Just to give you a couple examples of some of the, the comments uh, contained in there. Ann Shoup from Empire, Michigan wrote, Please adopt the next generation science standards without delay. An understanding of climate science will be critically important to our children's futures. Thank you. Uh, James Livingston from Scandia uh, wrote, as a university professor in the state, I must emphasize the importance of adopting these standards and uh, in training the coming generations of scientists educated and working in Michigan. So just to, in, in, to close, it's important to me that my children learn the truth about their world, including climate change, which will have a huge impact on their lives. Uh, the inclusion of solid climate science for all students in the standards is, is one example of how these standards are better than what we have today and why they should be adopted right away. Further delay in adopting these standards is a disservice to my children and all of Michigan's children. States like Kansas and Kentucky have already adopted them, and let's not uh, fall further behind. Uh, thank you for uh, taking, you know, letting me uh, address to you today and, uh, and taking these uh, uh, petition signatures um, in support of the Next Generation Science Standards. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Paul Drummond, followed by Robbie Kramer. No, okay. <laughs> Thank you for letting me uh, present to you today. Um, Mr. Superintendent, President Austin, and August members of the Board of Ed. Today I am here on behalf of the Square One Education Network. Uh, the Square One Education Network provides funding to schools and other K-12 environments, enabling them to provide innovative, meaningful STEM programs. We provide funding to teachers and schools that are succeeding against all odds. I'm also with the Macomb Intermediate School District as a professional developer. I develop courses 
uh, that are developed, uh, presented to teachers within Macomb County as well as Wayne and Oakland County. I also serve on the Innovations and Program Committee for the, communication, the Community Telecommunications Network and the Ann Arbor Hands-On Museum as a science education consultant for them. The Square One Board represents education as well as industrial leaders from Chrysler, Ford, Eaton Corporation, Ingersoll Rand, Intel, and Infosys. We also have advisory members from SEMA and from Southwest Airlines. Our board supports fully the, the adoption of the ne next generation science standards. Any teacher or school that has received funding from us as a Square One Education Network and previously from the Convergence Education Foundation, uh, Foundation received it because they were in line with what next generation science standards represents. The science and engineering practices and design practices, the content that's embodied there is all in line with what our industrial leaders tell us we need to do. I strongly urge you, Square One strongly urges you to move forward and adopt the next generation science standards because we believe that when you have a, an engineering and job fair where there's 3,000 jobs and only 200 engineers show up to apply for those jobs is a problem. It's a problem for us educationally and it's a problem for us economically. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Robbie Kramer is our next speaker, followed by Sarah Stapleton. Once upon a time, a very long time ago, Robbie Creamer entered a classroom as an elementary teacher. And to be honest with you, it was 41 years ago. And I can't believe it myself, but it's true. Um, teaching elementary and middle school has been my life. It has been my passion, working with children, um, teaching them how to learn to read, to write, how to do science, conduct investigations, and to talk about what they're learning has been everything to me. And the best part, it still is. I'm also a science leader. I'm really here today on behalf of the Michigan Science Teachers Association. I am their executive director, but I'll be very honest with you, when I leave here, I go back to a school district where I'm helping chemistry teachers to look at their chemistry practice as they begin using some of these practices that are part of the next generation science standards. MSTA has been an active part of the internal reviews. We um, have, have tried to develop conference programs that have lots of professional development for teachers to help them begin to understand what these standards are all about. And um, I bring to you a, a gift today from the Michigan Science Teachers Association, and it's, it, they're honey crisp apples, and they're already washed. My husband washed them last <laughs> night before I brought them. But the true reason for this is really not the apple, although I hope you enjoy it, but it's the ribbon that is on the package. This ribbon has three different strands. Each strand represents one of the dimensions of the next science teacher, of the next science teachers, of the next generation's uh, science standards. And so what, what we know is that these standards, every performance expectation is woven together with the engineering and science practices, the cross-cutting concept, and the core disciplinary idea. And these three pieces are in every single performance expectation, be it a kindergarten level, be it a chemistry high school, be it a, a 
one of the, the performance expectations for middle school. And so the kids are doing science. They are beginning to use those practices of asking questions, answering questions, thinking about it around content, that core disciplinary idea, and the cross-cutting concepts, the big themes, structure, function. So weave them together. Remember the next gen is based on research of how best to learn in this day and age and enjoy your apple. We look forward to talking about these soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sarah Stapleton, followed by Tom Padroni. Hello. Hello. Thank you for having us talk. Um, my name is Sarah Stapleton. I am a, currently a PhD student at Michigan State of Canada, actually, um, in science education, curriculum instruction, and teacher education. I'm a former science teacher. I've taught physical science, general science, chemistry, high school chemistry, and AP environmental science. Um, and I am here to support the next generation science standards. Um, as you know, probably the PISA results from 2012 just came out, and the United States does not look good in science, actually, in anything, but um, we're 24th now in the world, which is pretty um, abysmal. And uh, one of the things that we know from comparative ed research, and I've spent a lot of time living overseas, so I think a lot about international issues, and I was a Peace Corps volunteer, um, is that si uh, the countries that have it, have it, they're, they've figured out education and science is that they, they cover fewer things in a lot more depth. And what we find is that if students can really understand deeply, they can understand across many contexts. But if we do a superficial um, spread of too many things, we just don't get much learning and much at all. And this really, really fits with all of the things that we know about learning through the learning science research. And so um, basically, NGSS has done a really nice job of taking really narrowing down the, the plethora of standards that used to be there so that there are far fewer, they loop over the years, um, and it's really promising and helps us get on sort of the same level as a lot of our inter international um, colleagues and, and countries. And um, one thing I will say here too is that I've worked with elementary science teachers this, this year teaching our pre-service candidates, and NGSS has been really helpful for them. It's been a way that they can see how um, practice is incorporated into content, content, and it's really led to some amazing lessons that they've, they've written, and so I think it's really promising for what it can do for our teachers K through 12. Um, more specifically, I'm a big advocate of climate change being taught in schools. As an environmental science teacher, it was shocking to me that there was a huge stratification in how much students understand about climate change based on the families that they come from. Our students from high income backgrounds often know a lot about this and our students from low income backgrounds often haven't heard anything about it. It's a huge source of inequity in terms of what we teach about in science and it's also um, a huge global justice issue that we need to know about. Um, the fact that the climate change debate that is in this country is only in this country, there's no other country in the world that is questioning whether climate change is actually real, is something really alarming to me. And it's embarrassing as, as an American citizen that when I go overseas, people have to say, why in the world does your country not understand that climate change is upon us and that we're huge contributors? And the fact that uh, students really need to understand this. I've been doing research on kids who went to Bangladesh to study climate change, and it was phenomenally important to them and um, has changed the way they think about the world, their life, their actions, and their responsibility. So please, please. Thank you. It's a fight, but it's really worth it. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Our next speaker, our final speaker, unless someone else has a form, is Tom Padroni. Thank you so much. My name is Tom Padroni. I am an associate professor of curriculum studies at Wayne State University. I have yet to catch up on the news of what was talked about this morning and possibly at lunch as well. But my comments are going to be based on the assumption that there is still some possibility, although I understand that possibility is mitigated now, that given that the EA is the only entity that is available right now, that, that someone may be moving schools into that entity, possibly 10 or more, uh, as early as next month. Okay? Uh, even if that is no longer the case, I still think my comments will be helpful to consider. Putting more schools in the EAA is premised on the assumption that the claims of student growth uh, presented by, reported by Ms. Esselman must be correct, and that the parents who have used choice to leave EAA, EAA must 
basically have a preference to not have their children <laughs> attend school during the summer months for the most part. To me, this reflects a classic disposition of readily accepting information that validates one's viewpoint and dismissing information that seems to contradict it. Why should the claims of Ms. Esselman be doubted or treated with skepticism? The EAA first came forward with spectacular sounding gains in February of last year. At the time, those of us who heard of the scores reacted with a mix of fascination and because we are researchers to the desire to delve more deeply to validate the claims. As someone who has monitored educational developments in Detroit as a researcher for quite some time, I was eager to know more. But when I tried to get my hands on any information on the scores other than Ms. Esselman's pronouncement of the positive results, I learned this information was simply not available to us. I contacted each of the reporters who had reported the claims and asked if they had received any underlying data or simply just the pronouncements of Ms. Esselman. It turned out that none of them had received any information other than her pronouncement of the results. I then asked Ms. Esselman directly for the information numerous times. She simply didn't return my calls. I then filed a Freedom of Information Act request and waited for more than the legally permissible time for the information. Finally, I received documents for which I had to pay several hundred dollars out of my family's personal finances. If the information I received in response had simply validated Ms. Esselman's claims, then my conclusion would have been that the growth was indeed real and that the EAA had just been too busy to get the information out or respond to my request. <coughs> but that's not what I found at all. Instead, I found that there were very good reasons for Ms. Esselman not wanting to share the information with me. What I learned from the, free the FOIA materials that I received confirmed anecdotal stories that I and others had heard from teachers at the schools about conditions surrounding the baseline test. Remember, the results of the baseline test are what every claim of growth made since then is measured against. What Ms. Esselman hadn't shared with us was that 15% of students in second grade to 11th grade took the wrong reading test, a test meant for kindergartners and first graders. She didn't want us to know that the wireless infrastructure was simply not ready for the test, that students couldn't connect, that logins didn't work, that when they did work, students were booted out of the system, the headphones needed for the test were not available. The list goes on. Now, we can have sympathy for teachers and administrators in a new educational system that experiences that kind of difficulty at its launch. I'll just finish up quickly. However, while we can have a sympathy for those conditions, that doesn't mean we should accept the validity of that baseline. We all know from our own time in school that to have a valid comparison of a baseline to later achievement, we need to have constant conditions. Those conditions didn't exist in the initial test. Students experienced massive frustration with the test, and apparently many found it difficult to take the test too seriously, given all the glitches that need to be worked out. Many took the wrong test. While that lack of validity of the baseline comparison is of concern, and therefore also subsequent, subsequent claims made about growth relative to that baseline, what is more concerning to me and what should be more concerning to you is the issue of trustworthiness that underlies what I just described. I have been referring to Mary Esselman as Ms. Esselman, but she's actually Dr. Esselman. She knows very well the need for consistency in testing conditions to make valid comparisons. But she also has a strong interest in making the EAA sound like a success. A lot is riding on the success or the appearance of that success. Many relationships she has in the state are premised on it. Her job and Dr. Covington's job are premised on the delivery of results. No one can argue that. With her doctorate, Dr. Elsman chose to not make the information I was eventually able to obtain readily available to the public because she understood the implications as well. Why do we, con why do we conduct a full audit of the EAA's finances and not the processes by which it makes claims that would lead Mr. Clan Flanagan or anyone else to be willing to put 10 or more schools into the district? Don't the children and their families in the affected school districts deserve such an audit? Even Scantron, the maker of the assessment, cast doubt on the claims that the EAA has made. Since then, the EAA has made even more spectacular claims of growth. But my family, frankly, is not in a financial position to pay for the Freedom of Information Act request to check on this. Perhaps you, Mr. Flanagan, will agree that it's not my family's responsibility to conduct this audit of the EAA before you decide or anyone decides to put more schools into it. While Dr. Esselman's claims are imprudently taken at face value, the mass action of parents leaving the EAA is readily dismissed by many or explained away as related to the desire to not have their children in school during the summer months. Anyone who has any faith in parents to make the best choices for their children would say that the parents should at least be consulted about why they left by the thousands after only one year. Why is this not seen as important data worth further investigation? If the massive gains that the EA reports are true, and certainly the public has been made aware of these growth claims, then we would expect people to be moving from Detroit's other failing schools to the EA in mass, <laughs> but they don't do it. Could it be that families in Detroit, those with kids in the EA or in other schools, have been paying attention to data that you are not hearing? 
Perhaps they have been paying attention to reports of extremely unruly conditions at the schools that result in the explosion of disciplinary incidents and then the suppression, according to many teachers, of further reporting of those incidents. Can it be that those parents have been hearing the stories of massive teacher turnover, of teacher inexperience, of equipment not working, of materials not being loaded into the computer platform as they were promised, of children having no safeguards placed on their laptops that would prevent them from accessing YouTube, Facebook, and even pornography as reported in one fourth grade classroom? Obviously, the lack of a block can be addressed and likely has been addressed by now in many circumstances, <laughs> but what does it communicate to parents of children in EA schools that those blocks were not there for most of the first school year? You cannot in good faith, no one can in good faith add any more schools to the EAA before an audit is done, an audit of the concerns of parents who left the schools in mass, and until we audit the growth claims as thoroughly as the finances of the EAA are now being audited. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all helpful insights and again I wasn't sure if you were here a little earlier professor but the reason we're not putting them in this month and have postponed that is because I too am not comfortable with that only option and we're looking for other options um, I'm I'll leave it at that I mean we have public school teachers there that I think are doing their best there are questions perhaps about the system itself but um, it's for that very reason that we want to be sure. And I hope we were thinking the legislature would give us other options by the end of the year. They did not. So we are hoping for that in the new year. And, uh, but understand a lot of the points that have been made here. Probably should have, we, we realized a little while ago, we probably should have used a different headline last week because we thought what we were getting across was we're postponing it and not doing it in December because that's what we kept saying all year we were going to do. So by announcing that we were going to do it next year, we missed the main sound bite, I guess, which is we're not doing it this year. January. Well, the press release didn't say that, but. I understand your point, and thanks for everyone taking the time to be here. And the science folks, you know, I could tell there's like an aura above the smarts in the room with the science and the, and the professors and the EAA folks who, who mean best for our kids in the state. So thanks for everyone taking the time to be with us today. And, and you're welcome to stay. There's more fun coming. In fact, right away, we're bringing Vanessa Kiesler and Linda forward to the front on a presentation on Michigan Student Data Project. Yeah, you know, thank you. Thank you for that reminder. We've had new employees sitting with us quite a while, and you're welcome to stay the rest of the night. But uh, why don't we start with, uh, I think, Joseph, are you the first one? With not a one person decision. I have a limited number of deputies, and I guess the only one that doesn't have a new one. So, Vanessa. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we are thrilled to have two new employees in the Department of Education Services. That, that would be the Division of Education Services, not the Department. Um, I'd like to announce Luana Borka, who has joined our Office of Career and Technical Education as a fiscal specialist, I think. Um, Leanne, would you like to just briefly say hello to the board and introduce yourself? Hi, good afternoon. Um, I'm Luana Borka. I work with Patty Cantu in the Office of Career and Educational and all technical <laughs> education, excuse me. Um, sorry, I didn't say. Um, what I do there is I'm the fiscal specialist for that particular office as well as I'm going to be learning and be the expertise on the Perkins funding that the department receives. Okay. And we also have Natasha Baker who has joined us as a ed research consultant in the Office of Educational Improvement and Innovation. So Natasha? Yep. So good afternoon everyone. Again, I'm Natasha Baker. I'm a former teacher, dean, principal assistant soup in places like Compton, New York City, and Post Katrina, New Orleans. And I work with Linda Ford in the Office of Education Improvement and Innovation. Great. I'd like to introduce, after a year of a vacancy, Caitlin Fair. So, tell people what you're doing. <laughs> My name is Caitlin Farrick, and I am the new Head Start State Collaboration Office Director um, in the Office of Great Start here at the department. Um, Basically my position, I am here to work with Head Start grantees to help them link to services that will improve Head Start programs across the state and also to serve sort of as voice for Head Start in the overall um, early childhood system in Michigan. Um, back in my former life, I was a Head Start teacher in Los Angeles and I went to law school at the University of Wisconsin. Thank you. <coughs> I'd like to introduce Emily Purvis. Emily is in the Office of 
school support services. Welcome. <laughs> well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am working with school nutrition programs. I am split between uh, <coughs> Nutrition Michigan, doing a lot of their social media, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, so please like Team Nutrition Michigan on Facebook. Um, <laughs> and also uh, working with the National School Lunch Program, uh, doing administrative review. Thank you very much. Uh-oh. Our leaders are gone. Yeah, well, go on. <laughs> well, thank you, Vanessa and Linda. And, uh, this is the continuation of the Committee of the Whole, so I don't have to recall the meeting or anything, I don't think. Is that right, Bob? Right. That's correct. Okay, so, and you know, in the past few years, the education community has it's, it's taken steps to improve the level of education, as you know. The Michigan Merit Curriculum and Exam, new standards for English language arts and math, new cut scores to align with career and college ready, on and on. We've heard from classroom teachers and other educators from across the state about these changes and the role that each will play in developing the system that needs to move forward. We've not heard the voice of the student in any systemic way. Um, that's what you're going to hear right now. Thank you, Mike. Uh, thank you all for having us today to talk about um, this. This is an exciting project, I think, and an exciting time for us to hear, like Mike said, from someone we don't hear from a lot um, at this table and we don't hear from a lot at this department, um, the students. So we have um, a core of, of initiatives that we're working on. We're working on closing the achievement gap and being college and career ready, raising achievement and digital learning and technology and a number of things. But all of these things are experienced by students. That's ultimately who we're focused on. That's ultimately who we care about. And all these new initiatives, as you can see from the quote here, no matter how, how well they're executed, um, won't be successful if we don't get students themselves to em embrace them. And so Linda has been taking the lead on this project. Um, it's kind of a multi-phase project, but the first part is to understand more about what students, where students are at in terms of um, our education system, their own learning, and a number of other topics. So we wanted to show this important data to you at this point um, to kind of inform all of our collective work together as we think about how to improve education for Michigan students. Oh. Yep, and we had, uh, I wonder, reminded me, I had one more slide. Uh, we had several goals in, in doing this, so we want to have these various reform initiatives be successful. Uh, especially students who, especially among those who are eligible for Title I funds, and that's a, a large portion of our state, our, our districts and schools have, are eligible for Title funds. Um, so we wanted to build student enthusiasm for school and learning. Um, and we wanted to strengthen bonds among the stakeholder groups, so teachers and, and students and parents and us as well. And then we wanted to um, look at how you can motivate all those groups to play their role across the, the depth of challenge, or the breadth of challenges that we face. Again, school is about a community of students and teachers and administrators um, working to improve achievement. And so uh, getting those, those um, different stakeholders to work together. And then the final one, as we already said, was to really give students a voice. Um, although there are 1.5 million students in the state, it can be hard to talk to them all as much as we'd like. We wanted to start to systematically understand more about what they were, what they were experiencing on the ground level. So what we're going to start with is a, a short video clip of some students that were interviewed this summer. Um, they're bringing to, to light some of the conversations that we've had, and we'll go over the data after you see that. But uh, first of all, here are some video clips from this summer. I feel like I'm doing the same thing over and over for years, and it's just that I feel like I'm my time to go fast. Quite a bit of time to go so that would be my choice to do useful of this. Some kids like to do bad and think, and do their work, and still think they're going to get a good grade. My mom doesn't tell me, like, what the answer is. She, like, keeps giving me strategies. I can't tell my friends that teach you the culture at the most, we, uh, like, we, even the mid before yourselves have academics, but you still want to learn because they have a fun way. No, no, it's just boring. No one really wants to learn. They're just, they really don't care. There aren't that many classes to take that many students are interested in, and therefore many students lose their motivation to, to 
to take certain classes and to succeed. Jin's just going to it because it has to. They said it has to, not because they want to. But she wanted to learn and realized that, hey, if I, I'm going to be good, so I'm going to be a teacher. And that's it. Uh, so it's not in their heads. I used to be around the people that like, really want to make something like that. I've been to people who want to do baking and talk about sex and drill and smoking. I used to be around the people that really wanted to learn. If there were 40 students in the class, it was probably 10% who wanted to do more than they were trying. Hey, what's up? I'm I think this happened because a lot of the smart kids are the ones that get called nerds because they wear glasses and they walk around with their books and they kind of dress the way that you actually should dress like you're ready to learn. Some of them can really be smart, but they really act like they're not, but they can really be smart. It happens to some kids because sometimes they want to be cool, but they want to see what's wrong with me, they geek. And a lot of kids, some people be getting mad at my school, like I have a lot of friends that are really, really smart. And two of my other friends that just act like they just don't want to learn, get mad when I hang with them, like, why you want to hang with her? She's a nerd. What you mean? She's somebody you should want to be around because I'm trying to pass. They would think, oh, that's not cool. No one wants to be smart and do their homework. They want to go and have fun. The people who are smart, I think that they, they want to be actually in a group the people who have fun, but they don't want to be smart too. That's students in their own voices. Let's take a look at what's behind that data. First of all, our approach was to work collaboratively with the K-12 um, Department of K-12 Outreach at Michigan State University. And we have been able to survey over 2,000 students and parents in matched groups, with mom and, and the kids, or dad and the kids. 970, I'm sorry, um, yeah, 975 teachers, 327 principals and 50 superintendents and so we have been able to talk to a lot of people across the state about how students seem to perceive learning. Uh, we were able to do that through the assistance of the Ed Alliance and so they have uh, brought their membership to bear and helped us to make contact with those folks. Um, we talked one-on-one -on -one with some parents and students. I want you to note that we did talk to fourth through twelfth graders, and so we've got some of the youngest kids all the way up to some of the high school kids that you did see a little bit more represented in the, in the video clip. <coughs> we also were able to use the Harrison Group, which is a research and consulting firm, to execute these studies, to interpret the data, and to help us devise ways to maximize our chances of success at getting information. What we want to do is make learning a moral imperative <coughs> for kids and for, uh, for others around the, the state that are involved in education. In order to do that, we need to understand that the kids really are in charge. They're the ones who make the decisions. And it's interesting when you realize the average age that parents say children take control over some of the things that they do. They begin to decide when they're going to do fun reading at probably about the age of nine. They say, well, I'll, I'll, you know, they'll go off in a corner and they'll read a book. How they spend their money, they begin to take control of that at age 12. Motivation to get, to, to get good grades, age 10. Um, time put into homework, age 11. I'm not going to read them all for you, but you, you see that it's a very young age when students begin to take control over what their outcomes are going to be. Kids also know that everybody plays a role in this. It's uh, that they know that students needing, being motivated to learn is a key, and 93% of them see that as either absolutely important or very important. They also say that teachers expecting that all students can master what is taught in school is a key and parents being involved in their, their education is important to them as well. Parents and teachers tend to agree with that. Parents and teachers almost lined up directly that students need to be motivated to learn in order for there to be out good outcomes. Um, high, high degree of importance for teachers having high expectations and parents being involved in their children's education. What we've learned through our study that we need to do is to ensure relevancy of content and instruction to increase student interest in learning. We're going to talk about that in a minute, some of the data. We need to change peer dynamics so academic success promotes, not hampers, social status. Something we need to reach out to kids in order to do. And we need to provide ways for parents and teachers to forge deeper relationships of service in service of students and their success. Let's take a look at all three of those. So engagement in learning and content relevancy. Some of the biggest problems in schools um, making students want to learn. I don't know how we make them want to learn, but how we can encourage them to see the light of learning might be important. 
Um, you heard it on the video, not enough different subjects. As I get older, I need something different. I've studied U.S. government how many times? Their eyes, their point of view. Um, getting students' interest in holding it. Sometimes some of the equipment's missing or broken, said a fourth grade boy. Hard to learn. Kids know that they're disengaged. So here are the kids, and they say that it's very true of them. 38% gives their best effort at school. 26% are motivated to learn. 22% think learning is fun. 27% look forward to going to school. We compare that to parents and how they feel about their kids, and almost a one-to-one -one match. Student engagement generally decreases with age. This statement is very true of me, said the students. The, the blue is grades four through five. When I'm at school, I'm motivated to learn, 28%. They did use a different word than motivated when we asked the question, just for <laughs> clarification there. 26%, I find learning fun. 31%, I look forward to coming to school. 28%, when I'm at school, I'm interested in learning what my teachers are teaching. We'll add the 6th to 8th graders, 9 to 10, 11th and 12th graders. We're facing a major challenge. What kids do want is relevant content and clear goals. Notice that they find, they say that 93% of them say that it's either absolutely important or very important that schools are teaching subjects and skills that will prepare students for college or a job. 89% learning things that will that set a solid base for what will be taught the next school year. And 87% schools have clear goals that say what students should learn. However, <laughs> this is what they describe as being true for their school. 50% describes their school well across the board. So while they see those as being very important, they don't think that that describes their school. Half of them do, I should say. Um, we do not do a good job of articulating relevancy and purpose of content. 93% say that it's very important to them to have an understanding of why they're being taught the things that they're being taught. However, 43% of them say that that's what describes their school very well. Students and parents alike think schools focus too much on memorization. Okay, and you've got the students on one side, parents on the other. Resources matter to kids. 95% of them say teachers having the materials and the things that they need to teach students is very important. Using technology. Schools quickly stepping in to help students who are falling behind. 92% of them see that as being very important. However, 44% say that that describes their school well. You see the other percentages there. Students and parents say technology can increase engagement and learning. The difference that technology would make in students or parents making school more fun or interesting, 86% of the uh, students feel that technology would make a difference there, a big a difference. Parents, 83%. But what I find most interesting here is that the kids, as well as the parents, both see that it's very important to have technology in order to help students learn. Those, are, those percentages are fairly close to the other ones that you have there. Parents and students are largely in sync about technology and how it could be helpful in any time, any place learning, in raising achievement, and in personalized learning. And you'll notice that um, there are pretty significant percentages there. Peer dynamics is a very important piece in schools. Students say the biggest problem in their schools, some students try to drag down the rest of the students. That's my school's greatest weakness. Or too many students not there to learn, they think it's a popularity contest. Or too many students acting out in classrooms to stop teachers from teaching. Very few students think that their friends strongly value learning. So this is what they kids think, their friends think, about how important it is to do well in math, English, or in science. They do think that their parents think it's important to a greater degree. And what's really interesting with this one is they sit in the middle. So never doubt that adults and parents can have a strong influence on students and what they're going to do and how they're going to perform. Parents do matter. Promoting learning Taking a look at this one, let's take a look at um, staying out of trouble. How do they set up? 
par they, they think that their parents are really strong on, not, on them not getting into trouble. Um, asking teachers for help with school subjects when needed. Having excellent attendance at school and participating in class discussions. Students recognize that engaging in school can put social standing at risk. I think the good news here is that while the percentages are not insignificant, they are not the majority. 45% of them agree that trying to do well in school is a reason some kids get made fun at, of at my school. I worry that what my group of friends might think of me if I were to participate a lot in class. I'm going to bring you back to our goals. Help ensure success. We need to build student enthusiasm for school and learning, strengthen the bonds among stakeholder groups, motivate stakeholder groups to play their role, and give students a voice. We are working on some of those through um, some of the instructional components that we're working that we're devising in our office, uh, in, in having students become more invested in the actual learning process and not just in memorization. We're trying to model that for teachers. Also, the MAISA units are doing that. <coughs> Um, we think that we're going to be able to work with the PTA and some of the ed org, ed org groups who are very invested in this work to um, build some bonds and some greater stakeholder involvement. And my staff is beginning to work on what we might do to have an ongoing dialogue with students beyond the gathering of the data, although I see these data as being pretty significant when you look at the numbers we were able to raise. So for that, Mike. I you know I've admitted this before, I don't know if I've done it in this forum, but as a kid growing up in Brooklyn, New York, I couldn't stand up to some of the pressure you're talking about, so I didn't carry books home, and I basically confiscated another set so that I could have it at home, so it didn't look like I really cared about the learning, and I think the reality is we have to try to think of ways to accommodate that, not just expect kids to rise above it. You know, I mean, peer pressure is what peer pressure is at different points in time. I think I grew out of it eventually, although some would say not yet, but <laughs> getting there. But I think it's really a problem that we, if we can't help accommodate kids who really want to learn but also want to be cool, that can be a very difficult thing and uh, not going to help anyone. So, board, questions, comments? Oh. Kathleen? Well, Glad to have this information because we've been talking about how do we involve students and get their opinions and this is a good good start. This is great. <clears throat> One of the things that, that I don't see mentioned here, maybe it is and I didn't see it, is relationships between the teacher teachers and the students and the, well there is something about relationships between the students and the students, mm -hmm. but not between the teachers or the staff and the students. I think that's a key factor in, in having people see the relevance mm -hmm. of what they're learning, being taught. Mm -hmm. They're not learning it, but they're be, what they're being taught. Mm -hmm. So that, I don't know how you measure that, but that's the question I would ask if, in addition to these. But yeah. I, I, how are we going to continue? You're going to, what are you going to do to continue to hear student voices? We're able to replicate this at least for another year. And, um, and we're looking at in-house in what might we do to develop some other supports for hearing student voice in more concrete ways. So like Linda said, this is kind of phase one of a, a couple year project and there's other, um, within this project, there's other opportunities for it, but we want to institutionalize it okay. more too. I wanted to call out your point about relationships. The one that struck me is um, on the slide that says parents and teachers know everyone plays a role and how important parents how important they said, the, the kids said, and the parents said, it's important that teachers expect that all students can learn the content. Oh. And just relationships <laughs> aside, believing that mm -hmm. all kids can learn. And I don't know if we're at a place yet in our system where all teachers, all educators, all of us, all everybody believes in their heart that all kids can learn at a high level. And that's the relationship, that's the core of the relationship I think that's going to matter the most in schools is that you think I can do it and you want to see me do it as a student, no matter who I am, no matter where I come from. So that's kind of compelling data to hear the students and the parents saying that back to us and it's something that I think we have to keep working on at all levels of the system. Students knowing that teachers believe in them and are willing to invest in them is key and it, it comes out, and this, these are some of the data, and it, it comes out. Okay. 
<coughs> Gary, since you haven't oh, spoken Dan, yet you today, next? go ahead. Okay. You, and then Dan, and then Thanks. John. Well, thank you very much for this presentation. And I would agree that one of the things that stood out to me most was the idea that teacher expectations was, was a, big, a big part of this. Um, the other one that stood out to me was how closely tied, although it wasn't really surprising, that parent and student perceptions were very similar. Yeah. And it just reminded me of the idea of a mindset that we have in, in classrooms and in schools and in general with students that we come oftentimes from a place of scarcity that you either have the knowledge, you either have the skills, you either have the ability, or you don't. And that oftentimes if we're perceiving someone to have something that there's a limited or a scarce amount of, that can generate a sense, <coughs> of, or a, a sense of jealousy. And I was thinking about how it is weird that we still have a, 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 even a fraction of students who would say, it's uncool to be smart or to try in school makes me just think that somebody who believes that they can't do it or they believe that they, they don't believe in themselves would feel envious of someone who could because they're coming from a place of scarcity and it comes back to this mindset that they, they even said it in there, it's not fixed. That it's not just about the facts, that there's more to it, that they want, they want more than just, I remember these things about history, I remember these things about whatever it might be. Um, and that, that idea that there's only one right answer, there's only these things to know, and it's a closed-ended situation, <coughs> just supports that idea that uh, things are fixed and that you either have it or you don't, or you can't get it or you can. And um, I wonder if there's a way to help shift teachers and parents and students all together in that mindset from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset so we can come from a place of abundance where we know that even if you're successful and I'm not right now, that doesn't mean that I can't ever be. Um, I guess it's more commentary than a question. I apologize for it. And an excellent one that it is. So, thank Thanks. you. Dan and John. Um, I'll engage in a little commentary, too. Oh. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, so one comment and two questions. Uh, and really appreciate your point, Gary. I think uh, um, a lot of the literature on the growth mindset uh, this that I'm familiar with suggests that um, self-efficacy, right, students actually coming to believe that um, I can do this and that my hard work will help me do this matters. And there are other things that matter too, um, and we can't ignore, I think it's particularly important that we pay attention to those things, condition setting and whatnot, but um, all of that is for not if, uh, if students don't actually believe uh, that they can. Um, so uh, one comment, and a, just a quick observation, like on uh, page 27, at least on this handout, um, the, the slide here around the very few students think their friends strongly value learning, just a quick takeaway from this. Um, my sense about it, I mean, so the numbers are still too low in terms of number of students that strongly agree that I think this is important. Mm -hmm. um, they're generally in the 40s, but the, dis the, the uh, dichotomy between that and the 20s suggests that the problem, part of the problem at least, is not that 80% um, of students or 78% you know, of students don't actually value learning. It's that most kids, or kids think most of their friends don't. Uh, when in fact half of them do, the numbers would suggest. Uh, and so it's a perception issue, um, at least in part. I think that's just an important nuance to take away, and you're shaking your head. You obviously got that. Two quick questions. Mm -hmm. One is, um, so was this grant-funded work? And if so, who was it, and what restrictions are on it, and that kind of thing? Uh, and then second is, um, I'm, I don't know if you know this at all, but I'm just curious about what number of schools or what percentage of individual schools in particular, but even <coughs> districts or charter school boards or um, whomever the governance <coughs> structure is, what percentage of them actually have formal mechanisms for uh, involving students in the governance of that school or district? Do you happen to know? I do not. To the, to the latter, I do not. Um, something that we could inquire about, I suspect. I, I don't know. I don't want to make more work for you around that, but if this is a two-year grant and there are funds available in the second year, it just might be an interesting thing to know. Um, 
might inform <laughs> us in perhaps you know creating some kind of a model policy around actually involving students in the governance of their school. Yeah. We're talking about doing it at the governance of this table. And to your former like a teacher of the year. I'm sorry. We, you know, we've talked to how do we? Is that possible? Is it feasible? So states do it. Interesting. I know Nasby has some information on that. Okay. Yeah. John, please. No, oh, wait, uh, my, my question was the same as oh, Dan's. Who, okay. who paid for this? Um, it's through grant funding, and it's um, through the priority and focus schools. We have people going into schools trying to raise achievement. And the question became one of so, what if the kids don't want to learn? And we kept hearing from the teachers, what, you know, blaming, blaming the kids, put it out on the kids. So, we wanted to know what the kids thought. What they what they would react to, and whether or not we had any inroads in any places that we could go, and so because we could get access to the Harrison Group and their work um, at a very good rate, we were able to access it that way, and we'll be able to continue it for another year. And the source of the Who's grant the fund. The grant is uh, federal funds. Federal money. Oh. Title One School Improvement Fund. Thing. Oh, it was just Title One schools that we did this in? No, we we were able to survey in areas that would have a preponderance of Title One students. Oh. We couldn't go directly to the schools. We had to do a, a broader scan. You said with school improvement funds? Title Same. I School Improvement Funds. Okay. okay. For Sandra the priority and, and focus schools. Sandra and then oh, Michelle. I, I just have a quick question. I mean, when you said that it kind of raised a question in my mind, and that is, um, did we ask the students any questions about what they feel about our standardized tests? Because I know when I, ask question, when I ask students this question, they're usually like, yeah, we don't think much of it because we know it doesn't have any impact on our grade. I'm curious if, if we included anything like that. We did not. That might be an interesting question. We made it up. <laughs> <laughs> we did. We didn't present these data here. Maybe they're for another time, possibly. But um, we did ask them some things about, are you aware of this account, you know, what a priority school is, or what's the top to bottom common list, core. or what are, the, what, is, what are the common core state standards. And so, you asked students this? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we didn't ask them specifically, what do you think when you take a test? But we did say, are you aware of what common core state standards are? And in general, we learned the awareness is relatively low. So <laughs> we would like to increase that at the student level as well. Although you could argue it's more important that they learn the content and not the name for it. Right. But and your question, I think, even goes deeper. <clears throat> I think there's a lot of kids beyond standardized tests that have no hope and can't quite understand why even the test they're taking, you know, by a teacher on a given day is any meaning mm -hmm. to them. So it's all part of that package. But I think it would be very interesting to know because the standardized test thing, it has implications to it for other people. Right. And uh, if they don't care, then others are paying the price for it. Mm -hmm. Right. Michelle, you were next. Yeah, um, no, I think that's great, and I, I think it's really important to listen to kids, and you know, I and I think of my kids who, you know, I try to get them to school sometimes, and you know, as they get older, they don't want to go. Um, uh, but there's, I think there's a bunch of reasons, and um, and not necessarily because the class isn't interesting enough. Although I think that would be that would go that would be helpful. Um, anyway, I just, you know, I've been learning more that there's data that, that we're not able to collect, and, mo and I'm told sometimes it's because of, um, you know, the Headley Amendment or whatever, on just some basic data that would be good to have, like um, uh, discipline, uh, or how, it, like the, you know, with the effects of, dis you know, expulsion, have you been expelled, or have you been suspended, or it, it um, uh, punish or uh, there all is uh, there is alternative ways of dealing with behavior because the kids have brought up m misbehavior in the classroom and it seemed to be well how do they deal with that behavior in your school as a way to I guess figure out what the climate is like there and then I've also been told that there's no data on just like class size how many kids are in your classroom because that would seem to me it would be harder to engage someone especially at the lower levels, mm -hmm. if the class sizes are really large and if that, that affects their engagement in school or not. Um, and then, the, of course, the effects of, of the testing and maybe even being labeled as failing school or a failing student. So. Good points. I, you know, I'm wondering with, um, with that point, if the same way the board really develops policy statements for the legislature to consider, 
I'm wondering if there would be a policy statement or maybe just a letter to local board members, president, saying that nicely, but in effect, get off the Headley thing. You know, this is important data. <laughs> it's not that big a deal. It's adding one other piece of information and maybe appealing to them board to board kind of directly that we get it, it costs an extra cent to do that. <laughs> but it seems like a, I don't know that there's malice, but it, it blocks so many important things. How do we together make policy decisions related to expulsion, for instance, if we can't get data because people say, well, that's just deadly. But I'm wondering if a direct appeal kind of, you know, we're, we're doing it under the grant. Would that be? I mean, if they're collecting data anyway, I mean, I know it's students uh, responding, but it would be something. Something. Yeah. I'll think more about it. If you'd be willing to think about that, we could give you a possible letter to to sign that would encourage yeah, boards to idea. and maybe give examples of. We think this. We wouldn't. We're not just asking you for data for data's <laughs> sake. Here's a few examples that we hope you would consider. Because, please. I'm sorry, just feeding off of that, I think I've made this point before, or uh, kind of in compensation, compensation is not the right word, but in exchange for the cost savings you're incurring because of all of the uh, report consolidation that, yeah. that the state is working on, right? <coughs> I don't know what the number is, but you've shared with us that there are fewer reports they have to do as a result of this consolidation effort. So why not turn some of that back into, you know. How can we do that? We'll, we'll come up with a a model letter that will include both those points and see if you're okay with it. Mm -hmm. That's a good reminder because I think we have actually done that after the debrief and, and we're able to substantiate what's gone. I mean, we're all human a little bit. It's like, well, that was, what have you done for us lately? You know, you got rid of those reports, but still it would, it would remind them. So very good. Richard. I, I guess I would urge us all to, to take these findings with, with a grain of salt. Um, the uh, uh, a lot of kids don't enjoy school and a majority of those tend to be boys uh, my wife and I um, had very different uh, experiences of school she loved school all the way through uh, and uh, I hated school until 10th grade God has a sense of humor I became a teacher and um, a member of the State Board of Education. Yeah, right. Yeah. It's payback time. There you go. There you go. So, so much for my psychic history. Yes. Yeah. Um, Explains a lot. But um, uh, the, the 40 years that I've been interested in these issues, you know, we have shifted towards the kinder, gentler approach to um, education and uh, coercion. Making a child do something against his will is, is now totally out of favor. In the 19th century, they said, you can't teach a child anything until you break his will. And now, of course, we're, we're just on, on the opposite end of that here. And we sometimes fail to realize that, that this has a disparate effect on the social classes. Because kids whose parents read and, and uh, respect learning uh, they'll, they'll come around, uh, girls especially want to please the adults, they want to get along socially, okay? Uh, there were times in my school career when I had the opposite feeling, you know, I wanted to annoy the teacher. Uh, don't say anything. <laughs> um, and, uh, and as a teacher I certainly got that back, uh, I, I, well, as you've done to others, so it's done to you. Anyway, um, so I, I think that, that we sometimes have failed to acknowledge the trade-offs. All I'm saying is that when you make choices, there are, there are trade-offs. They affect different classes of students in different ways. Sometimes we get lost in Never Never Land and every kid should love school. That's unrealistic. Um, kids need to feel valued. I don't, I don't know that... that I don't know that having kids uh, sitting on a board like this or a school board makes any sense whatsoever. Um, I think that uh, when, I, when my father would repair the car, I had no interest in cars, but, uh, but he made me stand in the back of the garage and tell him if the brake light was going on. So you can be a valuable participant and give valuable feedback even if you don't exactly know what's going on I think I think we can affirm we can affirm that but once again to have a realistic rather than a naive idea about 
uh, student uh, uh, input or, or or whatever else as we as we look at these kinds of data. Thank you. There. Thanks. Thank you. And I know we're. I'm getting some hints that remember we have to, some of us have oh, to leave. Yes. Or, no, that's not you. That's on me. So. Good on this. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you. Thank and you. We're going to now thank move you. to the regular meeting. We're going to call it afternoon, the afternoon meeting. Hope you had a good lunch. Yeah, thank you. Time is now. Oh, no, that uh, item was actually we're planned for after lunch, so we're good. The time is now uh, 3.05 p.m. A quorum of the board is present. The State Board of Ed meeting of December 17th is called to order. Yeah, uh, we'll approval of the State Board of Ed minutes. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Thank you, Sandra. Supported by John. Yeah. Any discussion? I'll give the press Corrections. Okay. All in favor, aye. 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 Thank you and Mertz did a good job on seven. Public participation was very good, helpful today. Thank you. Um, introduction we did a new employees. Uh, John, President's report. I wish I could face so artfully to a bunch of landmines of Richard. <laughs> <laughs> the master. The master. Oh, or, or, I'm sorry. But no, it's <laughs> totally yours. Um, I think Richard doesn't mind setting them up. Right. <laughs> so uh, I wanted to thank the science standards uh, advocates who are here, and there are more out there. There's uh, and for being here and articulating uh, the reasons why and the urgency for us to move forward uh, and the petition signers. And uh, as we just discussed, um, whenever I think the department's ready and can cope with another standard setting uh, round, and whenever we as a board can move forward together to uh, advance it, you know, I think it's important uh, topic for us, as you've heard, and I think we'll hear more in the future. Um, two, I want to just um, finish and close with next steps on the discussion we had this morning about the turnaround district and strategy for uh, underperforming schools and EAA. Um, I think as we discussed, uh, it is very important that we clarify policy guidance and provide encouragement uh, to the most effective school turnaround strategy for chronically underperforming schools. I think we discussed today the, the contours of an approach that I think we can all support and that makes sense in terms of its being potentially an effective way to support these schools, which we do have to insist something different happen in. So I think we need to define further the nature of uh, appropriate legislation and or clear authority for the superintendent and criteria that would allow the state reform officer and district to uh, place schools uh, in perhaps a variety of settings where they can be managed by other public schools, ISDs, other public bodies, uh, but with clear criteria and um, and expectation, not more than expectation, clear criteria that they can be effectively managed and there's quality <coughs> control and that there are going to be uh, those doing that work, whether it's a district or IC or others, who have uh, the ability to turn them around, a proven record of it or the uh, clear likelihood and uh, a bit, uh, proven ability to manage uh, effective turnaround. And then within all that, we need to clarify the role and the next steps for the EAA itself. So I am asking our legislative committee and our agenda setting group to work on uh, our policy uh, articulation and encouragement <laughs> of the helpful legislation and or criteria that allows us to, um, to frame that and, and help make it so with others, I hope collaboratively with not only the superintendent, but with uh, the legislature and the governor's office. So three, I, will, I wanted us to talk a bit about the, the big topic that we do want to continue to work on school finance way we need to inform the organization and ideas for solutions to the school finance crisis. Um, I, I, I'll make it shorter than given the hour and we'll pick it up in a new year. Um, but I think it is real important that we pass these around to everybody. This is the second paper of really a three-step process that we want to um, finish and roll together in the new year that is about uh, first identifying the root causes of the school finance crisis, what's driving the stress uh, and uh, funding stress which and related performance stress of our schools, what are solid ideas for uh, changes that need to be made to do better, uh, and what we, can we, I mean our, our work can range from our own advocacy as a state board to advance the understanding of the issues and solutions to the issues, uh, partnership with the superintendent with uh, we're eager to work with the governor's office if they want to uh, 
uh, advanced understanding and ideas, and even finding three or four or five pieces of this that can be agreed on a bipartisan way with the legislative work group that Cassandra and Eileen are participating in with, uh, with Representative Rogers. Um, but I think we do need to continue to advance this uh, understanding and this agenda. The first paper that was done by the Public Education Policy Center that we discussed uh, a couple months ago um, had uh, really you know, 15 or 18. It was more of a laundry list, but I, I think uh, a helpful um, identification of issues that are contributing to the financial crisis uh, that range from just demographic changes, reduced numbers of students, uh, the fact that new schools are being created against this landscape and there's increased competition for those schools and students. Uh, we have huge pension MIPSERS cost issues uh, to figure out how to deal with. We have real cuts in funding for K-12 and taking K-12 funding and using it you know, pre-K and higher ed. Which we're all for doing more for pre-K and higher ed, but it's having some real impact. We have real implications from the foundation grant model in terms of it seeing driving rapid changes in resources based on movements of people and really some unintended consequences. There's no differential funding for more expensive education services for different age or high school students, uh, for poor students. Uh, so we're seeing some real impacts from that. We have districts and, and lack of movement on consolidation and shared service, which Mike has been pointing to that could be a, a piece of the mix. We have the fact that what was anticipated our ability to raise some local resources while proposal aid drove equity through a regional enhancement mill. It just did not work. It did not prove a politically viable option for raising more money locally. So there's certainly some interest in how could we help in responsible ways locally realize that piece of proposal aid. Proposal aid did not attend to capital buildings and technology now, computers and all the stuff that there's no effective vehicle, particularly for poor low CV districts to raise money for that. And we've driven collectively a set of reforms, whether it's common high standards or teacher uh, uh, evaluation and tenure reform that have been decoupled from resources to potentially support those reforms or even to support the work of the department in helping implement the reforms. So there's a whole combination of things that we need to really look at the root causes here. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I appreciate Mike's articulation of a Marshall Plan, some robust strategy for responding to the fiscal crisis and that is, is seen many schools, most of our schools, and even quality charter schools uh, experiencing financial distress. Um, we saw that Moody study, which, you know, acknowledged just from a fiscal reality the fact that the rather open new school creation charter regime is, is creating fiscal dynamics put aside whether you view them as high performing, low performing, whatever. So that analysis, and we actually had a very excellent critique of that first paper. I mean, we heard some critique at the board table, mm -hmm. but we had a good critique. Um, Michelle and Kathy were there. We had, had a, a session with some education policy experts. Eileen was going to come. We didn't want to have a forum and be out of line, but we had the folks from U of M, Phil Kearney and MSU and Mike Adonisio and the CRC and uh, Amber and Ed Trust and uh, some Blue Glazer really taking a, a, a Center for Michigan with what they're hearing, take a look at what those, that analysis said. And they were very helpful in saying you need to sort of package these 18 or 20 laundry list items into, you know, what's the right three or five bundles of things that are important, but they were, I think, affirming you were there that these are facts of the case that need to be arrayed and understood better and they were willing to help in their independent work to do that. So we need to continue to wrap that understanding together. The second paper, which again needs further refinement and development, but I wanted to share it, was that I would say, okay, what can we learn from other states? The way they organize and finance education. And uh, examine some states on two criteria. Are they like us demographically? Are they, do they have similar numbers, similar racial profiles, similar numbers of kids in poverty? So that's even the Ohio's and the Pennsylvania's and the Florida's mm -hmm. and the Georgia's. And then, are, or, and or are they a 
high-performing state, achievement-wise, uh, or perceived to be a big reformer. Florida, Massachusetts, Maryland are all getting a lot of attention for their achievement, achievement gains, reform initiatives. So I just, you all, I hope, had a chance to look at some of that. I won't, we'll come back to more about what we can actually pull out of all that, but I think it is interesting to look at some of the, the beginning points that may emerge from looking at other states that they, pretty the high performers, really perpetuate a culture of investing in education. The highest achieving states, the Massachusetts and Maryland, have post-recession even put more money into education while most every other state has been continued to cut. They tend to have a commitment and strategy for quality on their own schools, turning them around, supporting them, or new school creation, making sure they're of quality and not in across the board. There's a lot of difference between us and them in providing differential funding for different students with different needs, poor ESL, and different costs, rural, urban, uh, transportation. So they have more elaborate and nuanced strategies for putting money where it may be uh, important to put money. Uh, teacher quality, teacher quality support, clear path of uh, importance. Uh, flexibility, but continuity of funding uh, so that it's stable as we hope to you know, propose a lay would be. Um, and then some innovation in the way we do benefits, which you know, portable, flexible, but uh, making sure that it's funded, some of these legacy cost issues. So there may be some things to pull out from there. What I'm proposing for all of us is that we, we um, begin and we'll frame up in the new year, you know, a set of activity for us where we continue to both digest and make sense of and move <coughs> forward some of this understanding uh, and what our recommendations and ideas are. And we'd be very active in our own work here at the board, in our work out in the state, and in, uh, in pulling together good analysis and integrating it uh, as part of our shaping of the uh, understanding and then an agenda to contribute to this uh, as we move ahead. So I wanted to at least introduce that and, and that we engage the education stakeholders uh, writ large in saying this is important to help shape how we organize and finance education. What we're doing here today is not working. And the major reason to do any of this is that it's about our kids learning and are we getting the outcomes we want. So everything we do, and this is something that we talked about in the meeting with some of the experts, it's got to be organized around how do we spend money in order to contribute to better outcomes. And that's the kind of thing we have to help point the way to. So. Thanks, John. <clears throat> In terms of the soup report, I'm going to reduce it to two items. Um, one, first of all, I, I thank the board for, John, for your asking that the committee, the legislative committee with Cassandra, look at how we might frame this thing related to um, legislation. And last week when we postponed the naming of schools because I wasn't comfortable with the only option being the EAA, we followed it up the next day. Um, just to help people understand the, the, the logic of this, we thought anyway, we followed up the next day when we realized people, because we're inside baseball, we're missing some of the points. So we were more, more explicit and said, we need other operating entities. We need other operating entities before I'm comfortable to put schools in. So that was last <laughs> Thursday, got a fair amount of play, but I appreciate really the opportunity to think it through today a little more and then also to ask the committee to try to support other entities that we can feel comfortable with because um, I for one am not comfortable with the EAA at this point as the entity. The second thing is I really think it's great to continue on the finance role and um, I do appreciate your acknowledging the Marshall, the so-called Marshall plan. This is, I was doing a, what would it have been, a deficit elimination hearing, joint hearing and there's one senator that's always pushing back and it's not about money, it's not about money and I finally just said because I don't want to project as a state soup that it's only about money, but there's a point, so I was just thinking out loud and said, you know, why isn't there something like a Marshall Plan? Because this is the same body that is saying, let's have high stakes tests to, to retain kids in third grade based on one test, but maybe don't understand if we had a Marshall Plan so that if you, if you can identify, and we can, by the way, we've got this data now. We can identify out of the 4,000 schools the ones that 
kids come to school not knowing their letters, not knowing what some other kids have the benefit of, and then we turn around and still expect them with no additional resources to meet that same goal by third grade. Mm -hmm. So even if it wasn't this heavy penalty possibly of with all the psychological research around the danger of that automatic retention aside, but even with our hope that all kids can read at grade level by third grade, it's not going to happen if we don't focus on the schools that have the most struggling situations to put more resources in. And I would say this, that I think our experience through the early childhood funding says that we have a legislature and a, go well, we have the legislature and the governor that we have, and I'm happy to work with who's ever in charge, but, but they've demonstrated clearly they're willing apparently clearly through early childhood funding that I would not have guessed they would have done a few years ago, they're willing to look at targeted money. So I mean, I hope what we can project together is that it should be both. You need increases in the foundation, but you also need targeted money. And then what I'll just gonna say this, because we're gonna have to do this. We're gonna have to ask our friends in the education community to support that. Because as much as it sounds like that's a no brainer, I've been in that other world. I've been in the association world, and the pressure on them is to cross the board money. It's just the pressure. Everyone gets the same. So I think they get it intellectually. We have to help them have some understanding of the merit that, yeah, let's get an increase in the foundation, but some of it, like early childhood, needs to be targeted and um, would love to be part of that with uh, the board as, as you develop that further. And then these other, because I saw the look I got from Cassandra, these other four pages I'm <laughs> skipping today, and I'll, I'll have them ready now or ready for next meeting, because they're not, you know, they don't have to be done today. I yes, ma'am. commend John for push, pushing ahead with this and with these papers that he had gotten done by MSU's policy center. That has been very helpful. And I think it's really important that we do it soon, because I'm, I'm, I don't know for a fact, but I have a gut feeling that we're going to be faced with some of the same proposals that we defeated last year will be back, if not exactly the same, and very similar. And I think we have to be prepared to come with something that's, that's positive. Appreciate that, Kathy. Sooner rather, rather than to later. Contribute yeah. to the right ideas right. that are going to be effective, that are thoughtful and right. positive, um, and not react to stuff. Right. Um, well, that's why I think we have to have our own plan to. Some, Gary, uh, some good Lupe. ideas to propose. Gary. Yes, ma'am. I did oh. not have one. No, Lupe. Okay. Oh. okay. I, I guess I, I have to say that I appreciate the clarification that you, Superintendent Flanagan, have made this afternoon with the situation in the EAA, and I'm hoping that it's understood that there's not going to be any movement this year. 2013, nor 2014, until there's things in place that we can move forward with. So I think it is uh, clear to, in my mind, what your intention is, and so, and we're going to have some kind of policy together uh, to even clarify it some more, uh, because this has been very troubling in a lot of people's minds around the table, around the state. And, and I think this, uh, what you just said, again, uh, has cleared my mind as to what's <laughs> going to happen uh, from now on. So I, I, I'm hoping that everybody's on the same page and we all understand each other as to what is going to happen with EAA. Right. You know, and just to follow on that, thank you for that, first of all. But <clears throat> we, we, we were more optimistic that what we wrote last week was clear. But as I said, even when we did a very specific press release saying we need other entities before we're going to move them, somehow that got lost in the works. I do think that's the most crucial point. And I will admit na being naive about one thing. I thought right up to the last minute that we were going to get that from the legislature. And we thought that by putting a little more pressure on that entity issue and by putting more pressure on the fact that we're going to move schools might have come to that realization. It didn't. But um, I, I'm hopeful that particularly the, the board's thinking about this, our own thinking, working together on that, we can get some legislation that will 
will build on the 2009 legislation. I mean, as I said to you this morning, we're carrying out the 2009 legislation. That's what this was all about. But there's, there's defects in the operating entities, and there's also not clarity about how to get out when you get in. That's okay. the two most troubling and points. If you part. were to put a school in, we have to have clarity about what would be those circumstances where they can and should go back to their local district. So we learned a little last week on the legislative process. Um, they're home with their constituents right now, I'm sure, as I said, working hard, so they weren't able to stay here this week and help wrap this up. But, uh, but we'll hope, we'll, hopefully the new year will bring that together. So, Gary, we've been looking forward to yours, and we're going to – we're not. Uh, is it possible for us to do legislative yeah, committee absolutely. first? Absolutely. Let's do that. That way yeah. I have enough time to – Can you hold one? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Sure thing. Do you need this? No. I'll be very quick. Um, there was some legislation that <clears throat> was passed in the last couple of weeks, um, important legislation for schools. One was the, uh, what was called the EpiPen bills. It would require uh, school boards to develop and implement policies that provide each school to possess two EpiPens. If you're not familiar with what EpiPens are, epinephrine that can be delivered right to a child if they're having anaphylactic shock from a, a, an allergy, a peanut allergy or whatever. So it requires schools to have two of those um, on premises, and it requires training of two people in the school to, you know, that's administer great. those. So it's, that's very important legislation. Another um, piece of legislation that passed that the governor is signing this afternoon actually uh, would develop an okay to say hotline. It's um, a hotline that students can use 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. It's a confidential tip line to help uh, prevent school tragedies. Schools can report, or students can report bullying or any other kind of threats to schools or to themselves or to anyone in a school situ uh, situation. The program includes a hotline that will accept tips by phone, text message, email, website, or multimedia device, operates 24 hours a day every day of the year, and will protect the confidentiality and the identity of the person reporting. Uh, another bill that was moved out of the Senate um, Education Committee, it's on the floor of the Senate now, it's waiting for um, action is um, Senate Bill 74, which was cyberbullying. It would amend Matt's safe school law and re re uh, require a school district, a PSA, and an ISD to include cyberbullying as a form of bullying in their local board policy. Uh, local boards would have to include cyberbullying in their local policy by the beginning of the 2014-15 school year. And we did discuss this at the legislative committee meeting, and I believe uh, Cassandra has developed a statement for the board to consider. So, yes, please. Um, so we were asked to consider um, creating a statement of support regarding this, uh, which we did. It's a very, very small, short uh, statement that simply reads, the State Board of Education's Legislative Committee, uh, I'm sorry, the State Board of Education supports Senate Bill 74, a bill to amend Matt's safe school law to include cyberbullying as a form of bullying. Mm -hmm. So the Legislative Committee is recommending that the full board approve this statement that can then be sent to members of the legislature. Is that a motion from the chair? It's a, yep. Oh, I move, chair. Kathy or Michelle. Supported. Um, discussion? All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, same. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, I have a question to Marty. Yes, ma'am. Uh, on that hotline, is it K-12 and all colleges and universities, any it's school? Correct. I mean, it's not. It's, it's going to be a, a hotline that is operated from an outside entity. They first talked about having it um, housed in the state police somewhere, but from my, what I understand, the bill as it passed um, would put it out for a request for proposal to someone, to an outside entity to operate this 24-hour day hotline. So yeah, it's open to everybody. I mean, teachers could use it, administrators, anyone, you know, can, can yes. use this. Anyway. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Marty. Thank you. Um, oh. Now, Gary. Thank you for pausing a moment. Ago. Okay. Um, well, I know it's 3.30, and I'm going to save the video clips I have for next year. <laughs> um, I think we've seen some really great stuff today, and I want to honor your time as well. Um, but it, the last month has been a little bit less eventful than the month before, um, which was 
I think, a really great thing for my wife. So we got to spend some more time together, and um, I didn't travel as much, which was good. So I'm getting into that mindset. Um, but I had a really interesting experience the day after Thanksgiving. I had the opportunity to be in a float, uh, my own Michigan Teacher of the Year float, <laughs> in a hometown parade um, wow. in Gross Point. And this is their annual Santa Claus parade, and they have their all local groups, the Boy Scouts troop and the school band and things like that, all have their own individual floats. So I got to ride in a convertible driven by our school superintendent. <laughs> were you the Santa Claus or well, were you just with you? This, this was you. just me. Yep, I was there, just there are at least a dozen of my wife's family and cousins oh, really? in that <laughs> crowd. But I didn't know you were in it or I would have told them to you know, oh, be prepared to, with uh, interesting That's projectiles. Right. They wouldn't have been able to miss <laughs> me. Giant uh, decals <laughs> on the side. But uh, I had plenty of family there to heckle me throughout the, the travels. It was great. <laughs> Um, but I've continued some, some really strong work in the in Girls Point schools as an instructional coach. And one of the things that's happened is I've been working heavily at the district level to help them set up and prepare for a technology and infrastructure bond, that the language of which was um, approved by our school board, and it's going to be on the ballot in February for us to update our technology infrastructure, helping us to prepare partly for these 21st century assessments that we heard about this morning and as well to prepare us for um, some more mobile learning opportunities and digital learning opportunities. But this is a picture from a second grade class that I worked with who has a set um, of some classroom iPads that they get to use with their students in learning stations. And so we were running through some visual literacy activities to help students go through vocabulary acquisition. And so they were taking photos of different things in the room to form a collage of images that had to do with one of their vocabulary words for the week. And then they would put, they'd, um, show those up on the smart board using their Apple TVs, and the other students would have to guess what that word was that their pictures had to do with. Um, so a really cool thing. I've been, had the opportunity to work with a lot of elementary schools in the last month, and it is just the most exciting thing coming from a secondary perspective to be able to work with the younger kids and be able to see all the cool things that they are able to do and the, the talents that they bring to the classroom. Um, so I know this has kind of been a theme of the afternoon, and I, I'm not going to be as Im impassioned about it, but at the Detroit Zoo this past week, I had the opportunity to run a Next Generation Science Standards training for chemistry teachers in the southeast Michigan area. And this was um, Oakland County, Macomb County, and Wayne County teachers. And we had 31 teachers from a variety of schools around the area who came to learn about some of the uh, science and engineering practices of the Next Generation Science Standards and get a sense, um, start to get their feet wet with, how do you do this in your classroom? And how do we shift from a place where the teacher's doing many of the things to a place where the students are doing more of the things? Um, and that's kind of one of the things that you heard from some of our speakers during the public <coughs> comment about Next Generation Science Standards is that we're shifting to more student practices in addition to student knowledge of content area um, things. Um, another great opportunity I had was to present to the Rotary Club of Gross Point and I was invited to be a keynote speaker where I gave a presentation on what I call the generational signposts of education, kind of going back about four generations to what did education look like and what did the world look like and what did technology look like in each of those generations to kind of show a trend for how education's evolved to match up with what the world looks like and technology opportunities to present a case for the need for things going on today that can help prepare students for tomorrow and not just what we see going on today. Um, additionally, last month in November, I had the opportunity to visit Rochester Community Schools and take part in a day-long tour with Representative Tom McMillan from the House Education Committee. And we visited a, an elementary school, a middle school, and a high school, where we spent a couple of hours at each building. We went and visited classrooms to see instruction. And then we also met with a roundtable group of teachers and administrators to discuss teacher evaluation. And this was an opportunity to give teachers a chance to share some ideas, ask some questions, and for administrators also to present some pragmatics of teacher evaluation view from the teacher end. Um, and it was a great and productive day that allowed us to kind of share some ideas that can then be brought from and brought back to the House Education Committee as they try to translate the MCEE report into legislation going forward. Um, as you know, I'm the president of the Detroit Metro Area Physics Teachers Association, and we had our winter meeting at Romeo High School, 
It was my first visit to Romeo High School, but we had about 25 educators from around, the, again, uh, the Metro Detroit area who came and presented um, ways that they're using the next generation science standards in their classrooms to teach physics, as well as some other um, handy demonstrations and lab techniques that they come to share with other teachers around the area. Had the chance to do some training for Oxford Community Schools where I visited Oxford High School and led a full staff development for their high school and middle school teachers on instructional best practices um, that stem from the Marzano Essential Nine um, Instructional Practices That Work series. I was also invited to go and visit TechSmith um, right down the road in Okemos where I got to work with them and their um, one of their teams that's developing new products to serve education and also to kind of give some feedback on products that they already have out there and learn a little bit about some of their new mobile, mobile video capturing tools to allow flipped class instruction and more collaboration between students using mobile devices. I attended the Network of Michigan Educators Conference right here in East Lansing just a, oh, over a week ago where I got the chance to see some of our own State Board of Education members who are participating in a panel um, so you recognize some faces up there on this mm -hmm. photo. Mm -hmm. And we had a great opportunity for teachers to ask some questions and to hear some great things from the State Board perspective. And Wendy offered some wonderful um, legislative information from her point of view. And then we also got to hear a keynote from Superintendent Flanagan at our luncheon where he showed us this wonderful video. Um, and I can't remember the title <laughs> of the video, Is but I remember that it... I'm sorry? Where is it? Grandkids in it? Your head. The, grandkids were not in this. The one <laughs> that I'm referring to was not a grandkids video. This was one about um, that we have the opportunity to do things for others. And it was a video of, I believe, subway system in New York and a gentleman who fell asleep on the shoulder of someone oh, else. Right. And it filmed who would let him sleep on their shoulder and who <laughs> would kind of shove him off. Um, but it was just a really, th it was something that stuck with me that you never know when these opportunities come up in life and that we have that same challenge and, and charge in education to do things for others. Um, and finally, the, the last thing that, that came up this month is I had the opportunity to visit Lincoln Park High School over in Lincoln Park and lead a standards-based grading workshop for their grade level, I'm sorry, for their um, department leaders. Um, their school is considering a push or a move to standards-based grading building wide, and so they brought me in to help them kind of think about what would that look like. And I think I mentioned this to you last time, but I met with a a teacher from North Point Academy in Highland Park, um, and he's got a, a really wonderful music class going on at the elementary level where he has a, a special boys mentoring group that he runs outside of school called Beasts of the Beat, and they were featured on Fox 2's Holiday Connection. Um, you may have picked them up, and I wasn't sure that video, but I'll, I'll save it for maybe the next time because um, it's a, a few more minutes than we perhaps have for right now. But they had a, a great opportunity to perform on Fox, and they came out and um, filmed their classroom and interviewed some of their kids to see what a difference having an, uh, a program that really invests more than just their knowledge and invests into them in their development, it really kind of like the United Way presentation we saw last month, really spoke to uh, what these students were able to do and what they were getting out of their life lessons in addition to what they were getting from music class. So um, with that, thanks again for the opportunity to be part of the state board, uh, be getting ready next month to head to Scottsdale with the cohort of the other state teachers of the year. And so I'm, as I'm learning a little bit more about some of those folks and getting to know them online, really looking forward to that national program and all the things that I have to look forward to it. And I'm very grateful to be part of these discussions and, and to be able to share teachers' voice. So hope you all have a great holiday and a, a new year. Dan. Do you take all the photos yourself? I do. You have a good eye. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And thank I, you. Thank and I'm you glad. for being part yeah. of this. Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad you're here. Yes, oh, I thanks. think you contributed really a lot. You're really a help. Mm -hmm. It would be helpful for your perspective on the science standard okay. idea and issue yeah. to oh, yeah. be um, fully heard and understood by all of us, okay. uh, including encouragement on where, how we proceed and why it's important to proceed and what the nature of this is while well, we've got you. And I'll be yeah. calling on you first based on <laughs> yeah. that. Well, I'll be <laughs> every, yeah. every presentation <laughs> we're going to go. Well, yes. you know, Dr. if you Science. know ahead of time when you feel like you'll be yeah, directly tackling that, um, you know, I can get in touch and we can find a way to, to, to best work together on that beforehand. Thanks, Gary. Thanks for 
<coughs> changing your original intent to be a doctor and come to this profession. <laughs> yes, yeah. it's very appreciated. And by the way, you gave an opening to Richard, who saw that arrow pointing to my head and said, "What? <laughs> why are the why is it the, why is it always aimed at you?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> But I know it was meant in good spirit because I was kind of in the back there. <laughs> yeah, I, I took a back seat at that. At that so Occupational hazard. Yes, yes. No, and I can't, you know what's People great about that group? the state board of members were, they didn't want it then, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You have to get the bag back, Richard, so. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, I think we're, let's see, are we? Here, I can always shave it. Consent agenda. So, um, talk about the grant? Yes. you have a motion on the consent agenda? Uh, Take me back to my email. Moved by Kathleen. Support. Supported by Dan. I'd like to. Okay, wait. No, my favorite. Do you have a question? Oh. Yeah, I did have Sorry. a question. <laughs> Can I ask a question about it? Okay. We're kind of informal. Technically, okay, no. Okay, no. <laughs> but, yeah. Is there a discussion? When no, is the discussion? Okay. Um, just on the number six, I just had a question about the technology oh. readiness infrastructure grant. And I was wondering the criteria since, what is it? Utica, it was $5 million, right? Utica got 500000 Romeo, no, Plymouth Canton next, Rome with four hundred, Romeo with three hundred, Ludington with two hundred, Zeeland schools, and West School District. I think both got over a hundred thousand. So most of the money went to them. So I'm just wondering. You know, I didn't see any money going to Wayne County or Detroit. So Help what what was the yeah. and very little going to like Pontiac and very little going to other. Areas that seem they would need help with the infra their infrastructure. All right, let's clarify that. That's a good question. And there is <coughs> rationale for that. But. Okay. Michelle, this is something I'm learning about right now as our district is proceeding through with our technology bond. Right. Um, we had Bruce Umstead who came out and met with us in preparation. Um, and so I learned a little bit about the, the same question that you had and, and how it looks. So with the grant money? Because I didn't see yeah, Chris Point the, getting any money either. With, because ours isn't, um, well, I'm not going to yeah, yeah, let's open oh, okay, okay. I wanted you to know that it, yeah. as I'm learning more about it, there's there's, a, there's an explanation for it okay. that. Good. Um, okay, so um, <laughs> so you said item six, the tech readiness infrastructure grant, and then you read off a list of names. So I'm yeah. just looking for where you are getting that from. From so that the, I um, it's hyperlinked when I went on to the. Uh, it, it has the grant, right. actual grant, and then who was awarded under the grant. Right. So that was through my hyperlink on my computer. Yep. Okay, so I'll, um, I'll just address in general how these grants were awarded, at least at large scale, and then we can kind of get into some specifics if you want. Thank you very much, Mark. Mm -hmm. If you recall, and maybe you, maybe you don't, because we come and say a lot of things at the table, but we, we, um, this is the grant that we took the 45 million and we broke it into five separate funding streams. Okay. And each of them are competitively bid under different criteria. So there's a, a device purchasing stream where um, that one's actually not competitively bid as no. it's formula. It's, Every, it's a, more of a formula, but they have to sign on to certain assurances in order to get the $10 per student toward device purchasing. And then there is, um, there's different pieces within the, well, that's the that's the 22i. So six, you said, is the 20, sorry. There's a lot of tech grants. The so tech I'm sure I'm about the, right one. the 22i are the trade grants. That's the 45 million that we send out under five funding streams. Some are competitive, some are not. They're to build the overall infrastructure. There are, there's other ones. Um, 22K and 22, and you have all these listed, and they have different criteria as well. So, so you are asking about the 21, yeah. 22I, and why certain ones got what they got. And and some of the more urban, well, that I the ones that I noticed, like Detroit, mm -hmm. Pontiac, Grand Rapids got less, and Zeeland got 200,000, Ludington got 200,000. The the school districts. Um, had the ability of one to participate and two to identify how much they wanted to spend within a set of parameters. Okay. And so this was the amount that was expended within that set of parameter, parameters and therefore awarded. So the other so the so Detroit and uh, Wayne County RSD did not apply. Is that what you're saying? Not that they didn't apply. They chose not to utilize the dollars for the fund for the purchasing of of 
devices. This is for statewide purchasing, and it was a pilot, yeah. and they chose not to be a part of it or were not able to utilize the dollars within the parameters that were set for them. Bruce, did you have okay. something to add to? Yeah. Please. I asked him to be around. Yeah, Thank no, you. I know. He, he heard you. He, <laughs> was that old teacher <laughs> look? Yeah. Not old teacher. Former. The, um, the participation grant, everyone received $10 a student if they agreed to participate in the grant. The rest was based on whether or not they signed up for the other activities. One of the activities was a device purchasing pilot to see if we could have schools purchase their devices together. So Copper Country ISD put together a statewide bid and invited uh, schools both to tell us how much they wanted to purchase, and so those were the devices that were bid, but also then to come on and buy off of those contracts. And so the, they received up to $100 per device if they buy off those state contracts. So what we're trying to do is get people to buy together, because right now districts do their own purchasing. So they used the state contracts. They purchased $39 million worth of equipment for $30 million. <coughs> and we incentivized $5 million of the, that purchase. So we gave them another $5 million of value, $100, right around about $98 per device for buying off that contract. The districts you're asking about didn't participate. They, they chose not to take their own funds and purchase. The ones that did are listed here, and then we awarded them up to $100 per device purchased. The goal here is to drive the price down of the, of the, yeah, of the devices idea. by doing group buying. Okay. So this was a pilot to see if we could continue that or move that process I think I got, along. I think I got, so is it, what are, you said it was someplace up in the UP? So. Yeah, the UP ISD, um, they organized it okay. and ran it for the That's whole state. For the whole state. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we have the entire state participating in the grant. There's five regions, and uh, Copper Country is running the northern region, and they decided to take that activity and run it for the state. There's always... Interesting that the, the big cities didn't want right. to do that. Yeah, right. yeah, they would need internet more than anyone. <laughs> yes, they do. Yeah. Uh, they might not have been in the in the um, in the position to purchase. They, you know, there's a cycle that districts go through and refresh, and some districts chose to participate and some didn't. The ones that you mentioned also went out for a technology bond, so there were no limitations on the type of districts that could participate as long as they signed up for the, the initial participation. Which I think is what, like, our district okay. won't be in that position until next year. So you'll do it then? And so one of the things when we met with Bruce was that we found out that if our timing works out right, that we can purchase devices before the, the trig grant activity is mm -hmm. finished, mm -hmm. then we'd have the opportunity to take advantage of that incentive should we purchase our devices through the Copper, uh, Copper mm -hmm. County um, or through that program. Okay. And but there's no way to make that applying for those that grant money more flexible so that more districts can take advantage of it? I mean, I, maybe I'm not understanding. Sorry. Well, we had over 90% of the districts apply to participate, so they were eligible last year. And we're expecting the same level of participation this year. The deadline is this Friday to participate. Oh. And then uh, we'll, we're anticipating $7 million being available. Um, it might be structured slightly different, but it still allow all the districts to participate. And so... Um, like Gary was suggesting that perhaps his district would be able to take advantage of it. We will only have one window. It'll be in the, in the late spring, early summer, and that's the purchasing time frame. And then they will receive the incentive in August. And what's nice about the incentive is it's operating funds that can't be put back into general fund that must go towards uh, improving the, the school's um, readiness, and that can include professional development. So in the case of Gross Point, they're going to be able to hire additional staff to support the rollout and provide additional professional development, uh, provide in the building wireless and other things that maybe their, their bonding will not allow for. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we had a motion and a second. The two items on the, on the consent agenda, that's not one of them, that's the one that's already done. Oh. Well, thank you anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it even more. Yeah, it was good but anyway, so we'll get to the consent agenda. No, it's fine. Just and to clarify what we're voting on. Yeah. Yeah, well, thank you. Two other ones. So we have a, a motion and a <laughs> second. A, a test to see if anybody knows what's going on. And yes, <laughs> yeah. they do. Yeah. Thank you very much. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. Thank you very much. And uh, I think that's it.
that right, Mertz? Comments, here a little bit. Comments from board. Yes, ma'am. Okay, yeah. yeah. I'd I like to, to um, tell you a little story that um, I'm selling. Can I stand up? Absolutely. <laughs> that I'm um, celebrating today. Can everybody see my angel? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Okay, I, and I posted this in, in my um, Facebook page. Um, and, and this is what it says. Okay. On December the 12th, 2003, I received this beautiful angel as a gift from Mrs. Muñiz for my birthday. And I probably will cry because this is sad for my birthday. I was uh, teaching seventh grade at Westwood Middle School, and Mrs. Muñiz was the grandmother assigned to my classroom. We were a tight pair for, ver for two very eventful years. Ten years ago, on December the 17th, 2003, which was five days after she gave me this angel, Mrs. Muñiz lost her life in a house fire together with six other family members. Oh my gosh. Mm. I will proudly celebrate her life by lighting the angel she so proudly presented to me 10 years ago in my classroom birthday party. May she rest in peace. So you see so many beautiful things happen in, in our schools uh, day after day. And, and, uh, and this lady of, in this grandmother's program came into our lives at Westwood Middle School. And 10 years later, I'm celebrating her life. And of course, I have the angel lit at my house today. Mm. Oh, it's beautiful. You. Oh, beautiful. Beautiful. Thanks for sharing that. Okay. Yeah. Beautiful story. Nice tribute to her. I Kathleen. Just want to say I was at, well, you said I was at the, at the uh, network of Michigan educators. It's, it's really so inspiring to be there. Those teachers, uh -huh. all of the educators are so, they're terrific. Awesome. All of them are great. And just to be with them and to hear their questions and to hear their comments and everything else. And Deb Ball spoke at the dinner and she was very interesting. She didn't talk about the evaluation. She talked about teachers, the importance of teachers and how they have to, they have to work to promote themselves as being professionals and being valuable. And so so it, was, it, was, it was a very interesting experience and I would encourage more of you to participate next year. Thanks, Thanks for representing yeah. us. Mm -hmm. and thank, thank me too. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it was awesome. It was yeah. truly awesome. And our superintendent, he 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 was like like a rock star after he finished his presentation. Yes. All these young people around him wanted to take pictures. And said, Wait a minute, I'm over here. Because everybody was over there. <laughs> well, that's because of the big arrow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. It was really terrific. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Well, thank um, you. I, 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 oh, you did. Go ahead. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Um, I just wanted to bring up uh, uh, an event that I went to and uh, a meeting I went to last um, Friday. Uh, there was Kids Speak, which was at the Capitol, and Richard was also there. And they had, and they were also Kids Speak uh, a few months ago at Wayne State University in the law school there. And these are kids that they uh, work. What is it? The Michigan Children, Michigan's, Michigan's Children, Michigan's Children, um, and, and um, Public Radio uh, was also involved with it. And and uh, it's that State of Opportunity group that works with them too. I don't know if you've heard of them. But anyway, they, they, they were at the Capitol and they spoke about the concerns of kids, particularly those in foster care or in, um, uh, you know, in, adjudicated in, youth. Adjudicated youth, okay, or somehow in some sort of a group home of some where they needed um, uh, supports like that. Um, and the stories were incredibly compelling. They were also very familiar to me. Um, and they talked again about just the, the transience and the m number of times these kids have moved and the trauma um, that kids go through and how that impacts them academically. And it in impacts children behaviorally, as I think it would impact any human being who goes through some pretty um, horrible things at a very young age. Or um, So that was very moving, and I, th and I think there's a lot to learn from, from those 
uh, folks. I, I've also attended a meeting on behalf of a faculty member at Wayne State University, uh, Angelique Day, and um, she kind of asked me, she asked me to attend this meeting on Friday afternoon and um, to speak, you know, because I was on the board, board of ed, so, but it was an informal meeting with people from um, the, let's see, uh, Department of um, uh, DHS, um, Human Services. Um, there, there was also a community mental health. Um, I'm trying to think who else was there. And there were some people here from MDE. Uh, I, I think Mike Radke couldn't make it, but he was, they were hoping he would make it. Um, they've been in conversation with him. But, but it's a program that I think we should look at and, um, or consider um, because it focuses uh, on middle school youth at very vulnerable ages. There's a lot of research to support this from people, in, including people at Wayne State University, Social Work and College of Education. They're really focusing on youth in middle school it, it, and that are in these types of situations and doing a lot of work around um, trauma and how to um, uh, deal with children educationally in, in these schools. And they're looking at com um, community, much like the uh, Great Start stuff that we were talking about, it combines these different agencies together so that they're communicating and sharing information on these youth um, to make sure that they get all the services they need to make sure the foster parents or whoever is the caretakers have the information they need and uh, that a lot of things don't fall through the cracks. So I've been working on that. I think it's um, a really good program and, um, uh, if it, and they're looking for funding and support to help pilot this and I know that there's no money to be just thrown around but uh, I, I, if anyone has, you know, I'd like to ha t have a conversation on this at some point and maybe have Angelique come in and speak to the board about what they're doing. Um, and uh, that's about it. So I think it's, I don't know where to, where to take it from here, but I think it has a lot of promise and it's well researched. And I've seen Mertz putting on, whenever something comes up, we put it on a tentative list for board agenda thinking, uh, for the okay. board agenda committee. So we'll, we won't lose that and okay. bring it up. Thursday, as a matter of fact. Okay. Richard, do you have something? Yes. Um, I, I think we all got the invitation from NASB to apply for a study group or that sort of thing, and I uh, was giving some thought to maybe uh, volunteering for the rural uh, problems of rural education. Mm -hmm. But before I do that, I have to make sure that the, the board is willing to foot the bill, because uh, that's two trips to, to Arlington, uh, for the meetings and then to the um, national uh, NASB convention, which I think is in, is it in Tacoma, Washington or something? Oh, is it this? Or Portland, Oregon, something like that. This year. So I, I don't know if that's if that's in the budget already. <laughs> I'm trying to remember. <laughs> What's our policy? We have a policy. Well, it's yeah. next year, so we got a home. I, 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 no. My recommendation had been that we take the travel budget and just put it equally among all members of the board, um, and folks could use it as they saw around work that was uh, tied to their board affiliation. And for folks who weren't going to, you could always approach a colleague who was not going to use up their budget and ask them for some portion of theirs if your expenses were going to exceed your allotment. That was my recommendation. I don't know that we. I think we. Made a and we I voted. Think we did on formalize it. it. I think we did. That I think, and then policy. Yeah. Carol, is this a new year then that we? No, after the October one. Policy is in place until they change it. No, 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 I mean fiscally, oh, for fiscally in terms of money yeah. available, October 1 was a new oh, year. Right. yeah. I, I think maybe in order to effectuate have enough money, Richard? we would just need to know what, huh? how much money, money we have well, for each of us well, as of October 1. The, and if your NASB, what, what you agreed upon is like your NASB mm -hmm. meetings would come off the top and then it would be split. So you're asking about a NASB study group, Thank right? You. Yes. I think the appointee for to your NASB appointee, yeah. was off the top, and then, if, but I do think if it was New additional beyond that, like that, it was the required meeting, and then additional above that would be. So the one's going to be picked up off well, the top, right? Yeah. The, you guys are wrapped. You're. Yeah, I'm a delegate, but you know, I, I haven't signed up for a study group, and I would be grateful. Um, for Richard for doing that and being part of that study group in rural and informed because yeah, most of us are not very rural. helpful yeah groups. yeah I would yeah, be I, open to seeding my opportunity to go to, 
to him on the on this issue. I mean, this is a board call, yeah, so we would we'll just carry out whatever you want. There's also something in in January that we were all invited to. I don't remember. And I don't remember the details. It might be a next oh, generation. Oh, it's such, yeah, next, next generation, generation science, science stands. Or did, yeah, it was. And yeah. I think part of it is covered. I don't know if anybody's planning to go to that. It was a, it would, that might be helpful. Well, why don't we get out to you? We'll get out to you now that I have the boss over here. Give me one of these. We'll get yeah. out to you. The <laughs> um, I know. Yeah. So that we'll get out to you what we think is the current allotment. And if taken off the top what it is, and it may even fit within that without any further discussion, and if it doesn't, then I think it's maybe reaching out, reply to all, okay. for, kind of to reach out for Michelle's offer. Their, this is, their first meeting is like January 21st or something like that, so they're going to want to. We could, we could do this time. tomorrow. We could get it out tomorrow. Okay. And Carolyn Mertz will. All my stuff has been paid for. The three trips I've taken like, most recently Okay. paid for by. Mm -hmm. Does that sound okay? And we'll send a copy of the approved yeah. uh, <laughs> policy with it. So we'll, because we'll, in roll fairness, with the policy. We had this conversation. Let's roll with the policy. We'll roll with the we'll policy, and we'll send the dollar amount, yeah, yeah, and, okay. and then see if it fits. And if it doesn't fit, I think it's a matter of replying all that they reach out. You can have John's money, not mine. Right. John's right. <laughs> <laughs> John's got his own thing. He can do that, uh, that policy thing. Okay? Yeah. Oh, wait, you tell me. Oh, okay. Yes. Happy Halloween all for all the work that you New Year. Fantastic work. Yeah. I love you all for it. Yes, we love you too. Thank you. You too, Beautiful story on the angel to end with, too. So thank yes, you for that. I, Very sad, my gosh. Seven members. Oh, my yes. God. John, did that email that I sent you like before Thanksgiving about the word processing program? Was that yes, working for you? Is that you? Okay. Is that Dan making that? Okay. Is that you? Did you just like let a deep breath out? I'll, I'll get it tomorrow. I <laughs> told me for years, like, wow, that was a big size. You know, I don't even know that I'm doing it. Yeah, yeah, I heard it. Okay. It's going to stay here. No, it's staying.